Okay, we will get started with our fourth panel. Thank you all for coming back after lunch. Uh, in the order in which our panelists will speak, they are Jennifer Mathis, who is Director of Policy and Legal Advocacy and Deputy Legal Director at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, and I note with gratitude, also a member of the Commission's Maryland State Advisory Committee. Thank you for your service. And then Julie Christensen, who is Director of Policy and Advocacy of the Association of People Supporting Employment First. Then Lilia Tenanti, who is at the Office of Developmental Disabilities Service Director at the State of Oregon Department of Human Services. Then Carol Ann Carey DeSantis, um, who is President and CEO of Melwood. And finally, Brian Daig, who is Think College Vermont Program Coordinator and Research Assistant Professor, College of Education and Social Services, University of Vermont. Thank you. Ms. Mathis, please begin. Thank you for the invitation to speak today about these important issues. I'm the Director of Policy and Legal Advocacy at the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, which is a national nonprofit organization that advances the rights of people with mental disabilities in all areas of life, including employment. Um, employment is among the Bazelon Center's highest priorities, as it is for most of the disability community. Um, while Americans have made great strides in integrating people with disabilities into the mainstream of society, we have a long way to go still when it comes to employment. People with disabilities continue to participate in the labor force at less than half the rate of people without disabilities, and only about 20% of people receiving public mental health services have any form of employment. Despite the proven success of supported employment and customized employment, these services have been scarce. As a result, far too many people with disabilities, for far too many people with disabilities, the only options are sheltered workshops, sometimes paying subminimum wages, and day programs that do not lead to employment at all. We have the tools to change this. Supported and customized employment have been tremendously successful in helping people with the most significant disabilities secure and maintain employment. These are evidence-based practices that help people with disabilities work in jobs that pay competitive wages in integrated settings in the community. Supported employment is founded on the belief that every person with a disability is capable of working competitively in the community if the right kind of job and work environment can be found. These services help people find jobs that align with their interests and strengths. Supported employment services include identifying people's skills, interests, and career goals to help the person match the person with a suitable job, helping individuals conduct an individualized job search, providing on-the-job help such as counseling and interpersonal skills skills training to help a person succeed, helping individuals and their employers identify needed accommodations, developing relationships with employers to understand their business needs and match individuals with jobs, identifying how jobs might be restructured to facilitate employment of people with disabilities while meeting employers' needs, and providing benefits counseling to help individuals understand the impact of work on their public benefits. Supported employment has proven far more successful than other services in helping people with disabilities get and keep jobs. For example, um, for Individual Placement and Support, or IPS, Supported Employment, which serves people with psychiatric disabilities, about 60% of participants are employed at any given time, compared with 23% of people who receive other mental health day services. In sheltered work settings, by contrast, a GAO study found that only 5%, and you've heard uh, lower numbers earlier today of uh, participants ever left the workshops to move to integrated employment. Increasingly, states have recognized the success of supported and customized employment, and a majority have issued employment first policies recognizing that competitive integrated employment should be the default option for people with disabilities. Over the last several years, an increasing number of states have outlawed subminimum wages for people with disabilities, including New Hampshire, Maryland, Alaska, and Oregon. Um, some states have banned subminimum wages for state employees or for state contractor employees, like Washington and Texas. Um, other states have effectively eliminated subminimum wages when they stopped funding sheltered workshops, including Vermont and Maine. Still, other states, including Oregon and Rhode Island, uh, that you've heard about earlier today, have dramatically decreased um, the use of subminimum wages due to settlement agreements in cases challenging needless reliance on sheltered work and segregated day settings. In addition, the 
the federal government has eliminated subminimum wages for people with disabilities employed by companies that have service contracts with the federal government starting in January 2015. This momentum to eliminate subminimum wages reflects a growing recognition that successful transitions away from subminimum wages are possible if the right steps are taken. We can learn from experiences in states like Vermont, where subminimum wages ended years ago, and Rhode Island and Oregon, where Olmstead settlements brought big decreases in subminimum wage sheltered work and big expansions of competitive integrated employment. These experiences show that systemic transitions can succeed when effective supports are made available, staff are adequately trained, technical assistance is available to assist with transition, benefits counseling is available, families receive full information, and funding and rate structures are adjusted to support transition. Brian Daig will talk in more detail about the experience in Vermont, where since closing the last of the sheltered workshops in 2003, the rates of employment, the rates of people with disabilities in competitive integrated employment are now nearly two and a half times the national average. Lilia Tenenti will talk about the experience in Oregon, where the Olmstead Employment Settlement has led to significant positive changes as well. In Rhode Island, as a result of the settlement agreement to close the front door to sheltered workshops and provide opportunities for people with disabilities to transition from segregated subminimum wage employment to competitive integrated employment, the state more than doubled the number of people with disabilities in competitive integrated employment over five years and reduced the number of people with disabilities in sheltered workshops by 90%. The National Council on Disabilities 2018 report from the New Deal to the Raw Deal offers insights into measures that stakeholders have found most important to support successful transitions, such as adequate training of qualified staff, belief of provider leadership and staff in individuals' ability to work and commitment to the values of competitive integrated employment, assistance from centers that provide technical assistance on converting from sheltered workshops to supporting individuals in competitive integrated employment, incentives for competitive integrated employment outcomes, including outcome-based payment mechanisms, uh, using successes to educate staff and families about what is possible, uh, and bridge funding to support uh, the initial transition to a new model. Employment is not only important to help people with disabilities achieve financial independence and self-sufficiency, it is also a key aspect of people's sense of purpose and participation in valued social roles and in mental health recovery. It helps ensure autonomy, dignity, and choice. Subminimum wage employment undermines these key goals. We should be working to phase out subminimum wage employment and build the capacity that is needed to offer people competitive integrated employment opportunities instead. Experience tells us that this can be done if we take the right steps. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mathis. Ms. Christensen? Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to share comments this afternoon. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Association for People Supporting Employment First, or APSI. APSI is the only national nonprofit organization dedicated to employment first, a vision that all people with disabilities have a right to competitive employment in an inclusive workforce. In 2009, APSI became one of the first advocacy organizations to publicly call for the phase out of subminimum wage of people with disabilities. The questions asked of this panel aim to understand the implications of transitioning employment programs from paying the subminimum wage under 14C and from offering services in segregated or sheltered work settings. To begin with, I'd like to make a distinction between the two separate but related concepts in question today. There are two avenues through which individuals with disabilities can be paid below the federal minimum wage. The first is the use of 14C certificates. The other is through Medicaid, specifically pre-vocational and group-supported employment services. It's important to understand the interface of the two because because any change to one may impact the other. Regardless of which side of the 14C debate any of today's panelists may represent, I believe we all agree that it is vital to ensure that no individual with a disability is left without necessary supports and services as a result of any policy change. APSI came into existence simultaneous to a significant federal investment in implementing supported employment services in the late 1980s. 
The field has grown tremendously over the past few decades, yet supported employment remains the most widely accepted, evidence-based, and cost-effective practice for improving competitive integrated employment outcomes of people with disabilities. Over the past two decades, APSI member organizations who previously operated facility-based sheltered workshop programs utilizing Medicaid funds have transformed to a service delivery model that promotes competitive integrated employment. Supported employment is a critical component of this transition. There is clear evidence that sheltered workshops and similar programs can be changed and that services can be successfully provided in a way that is in sync with our national disability policy of full integration and inclusion of people with disabilities. Regardless, pre-vocational services are currently allowable through the Medicaid waiver and under Medicaid rule, an individual is eligible for compensation up to 50% of the minimum wage while receiving these services. CMS is clear that pre-vocational services are not an endpoint, but a time-limited service for the purpose of helping someone obtain competitive employment. However, in direct violation of the rights of people with disabilities, it is not uncommon to find individuals who have been receiving services in these programs for decades. Regardless, when Medicaid funding is involved, the law is clear, services must be integrated, and the ability to earn a full wage must be the goal, and to deny opportunities when using Medicaid-funded services is a clear violation. However, the continued utilization of 14C is a slightly different matter. 14C is not pre-vocational. It's a legal designation for work completed by individuals with disabilities who are not working at 100% productivity. It's important to note that 14C under the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 was hugely progressive at the time. The goal was to help injured veterans assimilate back into the workforce during a period of time when our society largely institutionalized people with disabilities. But in 2019, 14C is used to pay mostly people with intellectual and developmental disabilities a subminimum wage, despite the fact that the law was never conceptualized for this population. Arguably, the continued use of 14C now perpetuates the stigma of what people with disabilities can be reasonably expected to contribute. Consider this, my very first job, I was not very productive. Um, fortunately, I was not expected to perform 100% all the time. I was provided additional training. I was cross-trained for other tasks that I might be better suited for. When all available options were exhausted and I was still not performing to expectations, I was, as I like to think about it, provided the opportunity to pursue other employment options. <laughs> Throughout the entire process, I was paid minimum wage. The minimum wage is exactly that, a minimum wage. It is the lowest amount an employer is legally allowed to pay an employee. That is, unless you have a disability. In fact, people with disabilities are the only protected class of U.S. citizen under federal employment discrimination law for which there is an exemption from the minimum wage. This fact in and of itself is a civil rights issue. You've asked us to comment on the trends in 14C. There has been a steady decline in the number of active certificates and the number of individuals served. Some of this decrease is accounted for by state level initiatives. During the 2019 legislative session, 12 states had proposed legislation calling for some level of phase out of 14C and subminimum wage. To date, four states have phased out subminimum wage via legislative action. Despite the limitations of available data we've discussed today, there are positive trends that can be observed looking at the data that we do have. Of critical concern in the discussion is ensuring that there is adequate funding and capacity within the service delivery system to support the successful transition of individuals into competitive integrated employment. A cursory analysis of state level investment in integrated employment funding simultaneous to the phase out of 14C suggests the relationship between the two may have an impact on outcomes. For example, in the year um, that 14C legislation or in the year that 14C was phased out in Vermont, the state investment in integrated employment funding increased by approximately $2 million. At the same time, a moderate increase in the employment rate for people with disabilities was achieved. In closing, some today are going to argue and will argue that there are people that due to the severity of their disability simply cannot work competitively. It is my opinion that to accept this as truth is to summarily discriminate against people with disabilities by applying an inherently unfair standard of low expectations for their potential contributions to our society. Bill Stumpf, a parent advocate from Iowa, summarizes it best. When I'm asked this question, he says, I respond that by acknowledging that I used to be one of the people who believed that. 
that. But now I've seen what is possible. I'm not saying it is easy to accomplish, but it is possible. And to accept anything less is to deny the rights of people with disabilities. At the end of the day, it cannot be ignored that the only protected class of employee for which there is an exemption from the basic right of earning a minimum wage is people with disabilities. When federally funded programs and services contribute to this systematic discrimination, the US government is complicit in devaluing their existence. There is much work to be done to untangle the current systems that economically disadvantage people with disabilities. However, it is good work and it is the right work. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Ms. Tennanty? Good afternoon. My name is Lilia Tennanty. I'm the Director of the Office of Developmental Disability Services for the State of Oregon. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this briefing. Oregon is an employment first state. This means we support people to fully participate in all aspects of their community. This includes employment. The Office of Developmental Disabilities, along with our partners, Vocational Rehabilitation and the Department of Education, have worked diligently over the last six years to align our services and collaborate to ensure every Oregonian, regardless of their level of support need, who wants to work, has the supports and services in place to get, keep, and advance in a job. Self-advocates and their families have told us that they have, they want to be fully included in the community and they want to have opportunities for jobs with fair wages and opportunities for advancement. Businesses and communities benefit when people with disabilities are integrated into every aspect of our workforce. People with significant disabilities who are once considered not able to work can thrive in the workforce and add value to the economy. I'd like to tell you first about a woman named Linda. She's 62 years old and went to a segregated school and was told her only option for employment was in a sheltered workshop. She fought to go to a regular high school, earn a bachelor's degree, and despite this, she was still told her only option was a sheltered workshop because she uses wheel a wheelchair and has some significant communication barriers. As a result of Oregon's employment for First focus, Linda opened with a file with vocational rehabilitation and in 2018 was hired at Portland State University's Universal Design Lab. Today she is a research assistant at that lab. In Oregon, a crucial aspect of tra transforming our service system was and is to focus on high school transition age youth. We want the expectation to be that every student, including those with disabilities, will go on to higher education, technical training, or jobs like their peers. To achieve these goals, we need to stop the school to sheltered workshop pipeline. We issued a policy in 2015 ending any new entries into sheltered workshops and making it clear that funding for sheltered workshops will end in 2020. At that time, we had about 40 sheltered workshop providers. Currently, there are five sheltered workshops in Oregon, and I can say by September 2020, we will not have any. The impact of this cannot be overstated. Our goal is that kids, regardless of their disability, grow up with the same expectations as any other child to become contributing members of their communities. This year, four teens with intellectual and developmental disabilities were cast as, pro as uh, professional actors in a production of Hairspray put on by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They were paid as professional actors like their castmates. Luke was one of these teens. He is 14 years old, uses a wheelchair and a communication device. As a result of this experience, Luke and his family fully expect he will continue to pursue employment opportunities in his community. No sheltered work for him. The story of this musical was carried in media outlets throughout Oregon and I am sure helped other youth with disabilities and their family see what is possible with the right support and encouragement. In 2015, when Oregon closed the front door to sheltered workshops, there were 3,711 3, people in sheltered workshops, making an average of $4.74 per hour, well below minimum wage at that time. Some individuals made it as little as 10 cents an hour. Today, there are less than 300 people that remain in sheltered workshops, and those that remain make an average of 490 cents an hour. Additionally, as of September 2019, there are 2,107 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in competitive integrated employment, making an average of $11.71 per hour. Earlier this year, the Oregon legislature addressed the wage issue with Senate Bill 404. No employer in Oregon will be allowed to pay below minimum wages as of July 1, 2023. We expect this legislation will have the largest impact on our qualified rehabilitation facilities who do not receive ODDS funding for the work done by people with disabilities in these settings. The demand to inside minimum wage for people with disabilities came from many individuals, families, advocacy groups, and provider agencies who have seen the powerful impact of employment first policy. 
policies. To achieve these goals, we established our employment first policy, uh, established in our employment first policy, we created stronger partnerships with vocational rehabilitation and local school systems at the state and local levels. We offered transformation grants to provider agencies to help them plan and execute their organi organization's transformation from segregated employment settings into entities that help people access competitive integrated employment. We funded technical assistance for every facility-based employer in uh, provider in the state. We recognize that for many individuals and families, the staff and leadership of their DD provider agency are trusted more than bureaucrats at the state, no, ma no matter how well-intentioned we may be. Getting the support and buy-in from local DD provider agencies and case management entities was critical in this process. Grants, ongoing technical assistance, developing outcome-based payment methodologies, and walking with these agencies through every aspect of the transformation process were key to implementing our Employment First policy. We cannot emphasize enough how important it is to gauge our partners in this work and provide as much support as possible as these are major systems changes. Oregon continues to be a national leader in serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their community. In Oregon, there are no institutional settings for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Everyone has access to a wide array, a wide array of services if they are determined to be eligible, and our Employment First work continues to put us at the forefront of supporting people to be fully participating members of their communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Ms. Santos. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me here today. If you would push uh, talk on your microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Carrie DeSantis. I'm the president and CEO of Melwood, a Maryland-based uh, CRP. In 1963, on seven acres of unimproved land across from Air For uh, Andrews Air Force Base, a group of parents pitched an army tent and began to lay the foundation for a place where people of differing abilities could gain job skills and share in the American dream of dignity and independence through self-generated income. That was the beginning of Melwood. Today, Melwood is, has over 1,600 employees, of which nearly 1,000 are people of differing abilities, working across five Melwood campuses and more than 60 federal job sites. We also train, place, and support approximately 250 people each year in competitive work in communities throughout the DMV. We start by believing that anything is possible when people of differing abilities can pursue their potential. Melwood's employees work hard and take pride in the work that they do, and because of that, we are able to deliver performance excellence and quality service for our customers. As a nonprofit dedicated to advancing the idea of workplace inclusion, we run our organization like any $110 million business, only the margins from our contracts are reinvested into support services and innovative programs that create even more opportunities for people of differing abilities to enter the workforce. When I was hired as Melwood's president and CEO in early 2013, I learned for the first time about time trials, commensurate wages, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, Section 14C. Having spent most of my career in human services, I felt that this practice was wrong, discriminatory, and counter to the Melwood vision. Let me tell you about time trials. Time trials caused our employees to feel extremely anxious and stressed as employees knew that their performance could reduce their wages and harm their ability to live happy, independent lives. The time trials did not take into consideration factors that affect all of us, like whether we have a health problem that day or personal issues, something that could impact our ability to perform that task. More importantly, time trials just reminded our employees that they were different. It focused on their disability, not on their ability to work or their value to the customer. The average employee lost five hours of productive time as a result of each time trial, not including the loss of productivity due to the anxiety distraction. Some of our federal customers went so far as to ban time trials on site because of the productivity and distraction concerns. In addition to the immediate concerns of lost wages and lost productivity, these time trials also impacted the overall long-term morale of our employees. A review found that almost half of our HR complaints and vocational support crises calls were related to time trials. Faced with all of these concerns, one of my first initiatives in 2013 was to begin phasing out the use of our 14C certificate. First, we eliminated subminimum wages. Next, we ended time trials for anyone who, any employees who had scored 100% during two consecutive time trials. 
In 2015, we studied the impact on our organization of these initial phase-outs. At that time, 396 employees across 26 work locations were still covered by 14C and subjected to time trials. We reviewed the financial impact on our organization of the 14C certificate, including the increase of direct labor costs to our customers, as well as the savings realized by eliminating the overall um, overhead of the program. We determined that the increase in direct labor costs to Melwood for the first fiscal year would be about $500,000. We also calculated that the annual cost to administer the 14C program was approximately $135,000 and trending upward fast. In January of 2016, we recommended to the Board of Directors that we eliminate the use of 14C and relinquish our certificate altogether. This was a bold step, but the Board concurred. Since then, wages for workers of differing abilities at Melwood have been determined by the prevailing wage, time and position, and other policies that affect all of our employees. Melwood has not suffered from this policy, but instead we have grown from a $90 million to a $110 million organization just in this couple of years. The average wage for a worker of differing abilities working on a Melwood contract is now $15.68 per hour, and every Melwood employee is entitled to our excellent employee benefit plans, including health insurance and retirement contributions. In the nearly four years since relinquishing our 14C certificate, we have proven that the financial cost of discontinuing 14C was not only manageable, but a good investment that allowed Melwood to continue to grow and deliver on our mission. We increased employee morale and employee satisfaction and we now operate at more than 60 contract sites in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, and soon North Carolina, as we continue to develop new business opportunities and serve even more people. According to the 2017 Melwood Economic Impact Report, Melwood workers of differing abilities earned more than $27.7 million in wages and paid approximately $6 million in federal, state, and local taxes. Through their spending in their communities, Melwood's uh, workers have generated an additional 135 jobs in other businesses in the region for a total induced economic output of nearly $19 million in the DMV. We will soon celebrate 30 years since passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is well past time for us to live up to the ideals of the ADA by eliminating Section 14C. The continued use of 14C reinforces a demonstrably false and discriminatory narrative that people of differing abilities are not capable of doing much, that they don't warrant investment, and that they aren't going anywhere. It is a bigotry of low expectations that foreshadows and often directly causes a life of poverty, segregation, and dependency on public support. One self-advocate I've heard with uh, a guy with Down syndrome who has spoken against 14C so very poignantly said that the sub-minimum in sub-minimum wages communicates as subhuman. Today, there are so many hundreds of thousands of people of differing abilities who are paid an average of $2.15 and this or, or less, and this is totally unacceptable. As a nation, we can do better, we must do better. We've made great strides in improving uh, and ending inequalities in the workplace for women, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, and now we must do the same for people of differing abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Santos. Mr. Dagg? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak about the work being done in Vermont and around the country to fully include uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities into our society. I'm often asked, when did Vermont decide to change sheltered workshops? The answer uh, is Vermont's transition away from sheltered workshops began in 1980 with a support employment demonstration project. Key leaders within the state of Vermont and University of Vermont were driven by the values and belief that people with disabilities deserve to be part of the community like everyone else, and not, in, not institutionalized or segregated. The support employment demonstration project started in the sheltered workshop in Barrie, Vermont, Staff found community-based employment for workers with support and training from agency job coaches. It took about three years to successfully move about 70 people out of the facility into community employment. The success of this demonstration project led to replication sites throughout the state. 
since the initial support employment demonstration project, inclusive employment of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities has steadily increased. The sheltered workshops gradually closed as people found employment in the community or became involved in other community services. In 2002, Vermont closed its last sheltered workshop for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, becoming the first state with no sheltered work. Vermont's current rate of employment for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities is 47% compared to the national average of 19 or 20%. Uh, the agency that housed the last sheltered workshop actually has an employment rate closer to 75 to 80%. The vast benefits of employment for people with disabilities include increased income, a sense of contribution, skill acquisition, increased confidence, independence, identity, social connections, and the opportunity for people to develop meaningful careers. Employers and community benefit from the social inclusion and diversity people with developmental disabilities bring to the workforce through improved morale, uh, customer loyalty, overall productivity, and their unique gifts and talents. Observing people with developmental disabilities productively engaged in the workforce helps employers and community members see the valuable contributions of people with disabilities. The shift in philosophy and practice from facility-based to community-based employment services also shifts energy and resources. Since Vermont has no segregated employment, other opportunities are nurtured and supported, including a project search programs, the high school vocational training program. There's three locations of project search in Vermont. Um, there's post-secondary education programs like Think College at the University of Vermont. That's a post-secondary program for students with intellectual disabilities. Um, that has been going since 2010. Um, and College Steps has replicated that program at three other state colleges in Vermont. There's a Succeed program, which is another post-secondary transitional living program, um, and as well as Global Campus, um, which is a lifelong uh, teaching and learning program. So there are numerous educational and vocational training programs for people. Uh, people who have been re who would have been relegated to sheltered workshops are now students in these educational and vocational programs, resulting in employment. As the director of the Think College program at the University of Vermont, I see positive impact. Uh, I see the positive impact this program has, not only on the students, but for the entire university community. Students with intellectual and developmental disabilities today are preparing for life, or community life, and employment, not segregated sheltered work. The subminimum wage model is outdated and not needed when there are so many other options available. Services have, have improved so much over the years with supported employment, customized employment, self-employment, um, and expanding post-secondary education programs. We need to continue to improve and expand these services and not hold on to antiquated model with low expectations that hold people back. When institutions and sheltered workshops no longer exist, the overall culture changes. When people with disabilities are in and part of the community, the community is richer for it. Employers will hire and include people with disabilities at a competitive wage. When there are no sheltered workshops, it becomes the norm. The expectation is to be part of the community, uh, including work. I understand the transformation, transformation of services uh, can seem difficult and daunting, but it can and should be done. We've been hosting the sheltered, work, the sheltered Workshop Conversion Institute since 2007 to provide assistance to states and agencies with this transformation, and many organizations have been successful. Successful agencies have been forward-thinking in changing their culture and services to meet the needs of future generations, not holding on to outdated models. Younger families are seeking community inclusion, not segregation. It has been 17 years since we had sheltered workshops in Vermont and we have not looked back. It is time to look forward and create a better and more inclusive world for people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daig. I'll open now for questions from fellow commissioners. Commissioner Kladney. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Mathis, um, we've had some testimony here today that subminimum wage work is therapeutic uh, for people with uh, mental health challenges, uh, how would you respond to that? I think um, if you actually talk to folks who have um, run mental health systems, who have expertise in um, mental health and employment, most of them will say that um, 
employment is uh, the best treatment um, for mental health, that um, employment uh, uh, is key to mental health recovery, um, and that uh, working in a, an environment like a you know sheltered workshop, like a, a especially with subminimum wages, which conveys, I think you know as folks have talked about, um, that a person is really of diminished value, um, is damaging to people's mental health. And I think there have been some studies about certainly um, underemployment and uh, unemployment and the impact on people's mental health being devastating. So. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tenenty, did I say that right? Tenenty. Tenenty, thank you. Uh, how difficult was it to change the culture uh, from work centers to com competitive integrated employment? And how many issues do you face, what issues do you face when you, when you uh, work with employers trying to get them to hire uh, dis people with disabilities? Uh, good question. I would say in terms of what issues did we face, um, and I say we as a state, I'm not representing a provider agency. I can just say from looking at what, what occurred. Um, I think the, the biggest, some of the biggest challenges we faced was, um, were around perceptions and changing the ideas behind what people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are capable of. Um, people go into this line of work because they care about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and uh, that, that is true for our provider agencies that at one point were offering, you know, uh, sheltered work segregated, segregated employment opportunities. And so it was really um, an effort to uh, help their boards of directors who are often volunteers, they're often community members, parents of people who work in the segregated uh, environment, uh, to help them uh, really see the, what was possible and to uh, invest financially from the state perspective in helping them by provide, providing transition support, um, technical assistance, laying out plans for how the organization could move in that direction. Uh, it, I will, it, it was not, it's not an easy process. Um, I've talked to several executive directors throughout the process and I think um, I can say one of the challenging things that many of them get to a point where they recognize is the, the workers, their staff that they have working in the shelter environment is not the staff they need to be the ones going out and trying to seek competitive integrated employment for people. And so they, we offered training through APSI and other entities um, and they could put people through that training but ultimately there were you know staffing decisions that had to be made based on the direction they were going. Um, family resistance in those organizations. I attended many, fa I've attended many family meetings uh, for f uh, uh, family members who worked in these environments who um, just absolutely very resistant. Uh, very similar, honestly, to what um, I've experienced and others have experienced when you move, when we move forward with closing institutional settings. Uh, it's a it's a very similar dynamic, and uh, it's there's just the reality of what people have come to expect and what they want for their family member, and it's helping them move forward with seeing what's more what's possible, the bigger goals and ideas. And um, to the second part of your question, the, the challenges that we continue to face today, um, honestly, I'll speak to one that is not unique to Oregon. A lot of it ties back to the workforce for our provider agencies um, in, in who are doing uh, job coaching and supported employment and going out and doing job development. Um, that continues to be a challenge for us. And uh, other pieces of it, we did, we think we are about through a final step with our friends at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, getting approval on an outcome-based payment methodology that we've been working on now for about five years. Once we have that, that will be a hurdle that we will have um, overcome, I would say. So I think those are currently um, issues. Uh, another piece that I would say that we have worked hard on and has been a challenge is, again, along with the public public perception is employer perception and we've done a, we have had a big uh, very successful I work we succeed uh, marketing campaign in the community initially it was targeted toward individuals and family members helping them understand what was possible we've shifted now and we're focusing on employers and uh, holding up employers that uh, hire people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as examples of what's possible to their colleagues and other business owners in their areas thank you uh, mr. Degg uh, you mentioned about the seminar that you run. Uh, is this approach uh, being adopted in places other than states that have eliminated 14, elim eliminated 14C, and 
how are these programs funded with federal money? Um, well, this, I know the state of Ohio has done a lot in terms of, of, of transforming their services, and I think they've done an excellent job with that, and because they've put in, you know, money and resources and training, you know, for their agencies to do that. Um, as far as other states, it varies. Um, I know, you know, uh, New York State has done some work. Um, Ohio, it it all depends on the state and what their initiatives are. Okay, and uh, and how how about the funding? How, how's that work for you? Because I understand that uh, it, it's not easy all the time to get. It's not work. easy all the time, and again, it sort of goes back to this to the states and how their Medicaid waivers are funded. Um, you know, Vermont has chosen to individualize the budget, so the uh, budgets are built around the individual's needs. Um, some other states kind of divide it evenly amongst everybody, so that leaves you know very little to do, uh, very little money for services for each person. Uh, I think you said 47 percent of people have found yes. competitive integrated employment. Right. So that would leave 53 percent that have not. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. So what do those folks do? Well, some of them are looking for work. Um, some are choosing not to work. Um, we're sort of more of an em employment first state the policy and philosophy more than uh, policy. Um, so we don't require people to work. So if people choose not to work, that is up to them. Um, you know, others are uh, choosing community-based services rather than employment. Um, we really push employment. That's that's our preferred option. Um, but community-based services being. Um, well, they can use their Medicaid waiver. Ours are divided into the, either employment supports or community supports. So they could use their individual budgets um, for more community-based activities, you know, which could include volunteer work um, or going to the you know, YMCA or the local clubs or activities and things like that. Okay, Ms. Tennedy uh, talked to, did I say that right? <laughs> Good. I spoke about problems with the job developers and job coaches. Mm -hmm. And it's my understanding that that problem with those two professions seems to go through uh, these states that, that have gotten rid of 14C. Well, yeah, I would say that the direct support professionals is kind of a crisis level throughout the country that, you know, we need a lot more people, you know, to work, you know, than are willing to do that. A lot of it is the, is the wages. Uh, and one of the questions earlier was how to develop a career path for that. And we're working on that at the, we're looking at that at the University of Vermont right now to see if we can develop more you kind know, of certificate programs, you know, to train people so that they understand that it is a career track. Um, and that would make them eligible to sit for the CSEP uh, certification that National APSI offers to give it more of a, uh, more of a credible um, career. And uh, one last question. Uh, would it be what? What would we see, and is, would it be worthwhile to to come to Vermont to see how you function? Sure. <laughs> Depends, on <laughs> Depends on the month. Depends on the month. Yes. <laughs> yes. Come in the come in the fall or spring. <laughs> um, but I'll address the employers because one of the issues I think that happens is that when we don't have sheltered workshops or, or um, institutions or sheltered workshops, the employer gets the community gets more used to us knocking on their doors asking for a job. So they're familiar with the concept of supported employment um, to the point where sometimes they tell you that you're bothering us. Um, so we've developed um, what they call business account managers in the six regional areas of Vermont for voc rehab, um, so that one person is sort of the point person for employers um, so so that business account manager does, does the outreach kind of keeps the accounts of, of local employers uh, to kind of consolidate it a little bit for all the service providers uh, I think I have to yield thank you Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Arasaki <clears throat> thank you I, I have a couple questions uh, one is for Ms. Mathis um, so some argue that in the area of, uh, I don't know the right terminology or pronouncement, the SWEP, the school-based 14C certificates, um, there's only a handful remaining, right? And some have called for the immediate revocation of them uh, because of they believe they conflict with the existing law. So I wanted to get your take on that. Well, I think uh, certainly to the extent that they 
uh, they are being used now to serve folks in uh, and and really um, I think uh, transition folks from a school setting um, into sheltered work um, they needlessly segregate people with disabilities I think they probably are in conflict with certainly at a minimum um, <clears throat> federal civil rights laws um, the ADA section 504 um, it's complicated but I think that there is a very much like uh, uh, the lawsuits in Oregon and in Rhode Island I think a an ADA uh, issue and probably an ADA violation. Um, so I think with all of these, uh, you know, I would say um, they should be phased out. Um, certainly phased out, just like 14C certificates. I don't know how many uh, precisely there are at this point, but I, I think um, generally, you know, everyone seems to agree that to the extent that um, we should eliminate these subminimum wage certificates, it's important to ensure that we have the alternatives, that the infrastructure is there. And so that is why I think folks have mostly said, you know, we shouldn't necessarily cutting everything off tomorrow, but we should make sure that we are working with states, working with, uh, in this case, schools, um, to actually make sure that they have the supports in place to support people and in integrated alternatives. So what's the argument for not just immediately ending them, but actually having a phase out? Is it really the same situation as for the other kinds of programs? Or is there a different yeah. argument to be made? I mean, I think that to the extent that we, I don't know if others uh, want to uh, add to this. Sorry, I don't mean to be picking on um, just you. No, 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 it's, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but I think we, we do need to, I think, do some work to build, um, I, you know, we have the capacity, we have done it, we know how to do it, but it isn't there um, everywhere, I think. So um, rather than sort of uh, ending everything tomorrow, I think it would be important to say, um, here's our plan and here's, you know, the time frame over which we're going to do it and here's what we think we need. Um, here's, you know, how we're going to achieve it and um, have a reasonable and fairly quick goal to do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tennity, so uh, we heard testimony from a prior witness uh, that they're starting to see the kids who did go into integrated work right from school now starting to come back or go in, seek sheltered situations. Um, from you, from what happened in Oregon, are you seeing that, and or Vermont, are you seeing that, and if so, how, you know what kinds of changes are necessary in order to help them be successful so they don't end up needing to come back. Uh, I would say thank you for the question. I would I would say in Oregon we we wouldn't see that because we closed the door to the shelter workshops. So once transition age youth transition into competitive and integrated employment or other opportunities, um, there isn't an avenue for them to come back into a sheltered workshop setting. So what we have uh, in our system is. Um, we offer a wide array of services uh, that, in addition to employment-related services that we partner with Vocational Rehab on, we uh, the DD system has a wide array of services. We have people. We do a lot of one-to-one -one individual community support uh, in Oregon for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then I would also say, in a case of a, a youth who um, transitions to work and then maybe is not successful, to use the example we heard earlier about having other opportunities to go look for other things, uh, we would want them to come back through uh, the vo vo through vocational rehabilitation, um, go through another process. Maybe the job wasn't a good fit, maybe um, we didn't have a clear idea of exactly uh, the type of opportunity that they were most interested in, and then we'd want them to, to try again, just like we would expect with people without disabilities. So uh, so I get that you don't have the sheltered work, but do you have day programs? Is that a number that we uh, going up as it is in some places? We do have day programs, and um, we do have people who do a mix of employment and day-type ser services. Um, we have seen, uh, I'm trying to th think back to the latest data I saw, I think we've seen uh, an increase in the use of day services. Um, 
In Oregon, one of the uniquenesses that I mentioned earlier about our system is that we don't have waiting lists. We don't have a system where people wait to get onto a waiver. If you're determined IDD eligible in Oregon, you automatically have access to services, which is really good in a lot of ways. It, it in some ways, though, exacerbates the, the issue I mentioned earlier about capacity for all types of our providers, not just employment providers. And so it may be that people choose, some, choose a service or go to a service while they're waiting for capacity in, a, in another area or another service. So um, we do have people who are doing a number of different things, um, small group employment, maybe in addition to competitive integrated employment, competitive integrated employment with one-to-one, -one, what we call ADL, IADL support in the community, going grocery shopping, doing other activities in the community. Um, so we do have people who have definitely have uh, a lot of people with that kind of mix. And in Vermont? Yeah, we don't have, well, we don't have people returning because we don't have the sheltered workshops anymore, but I think the larger issue of this is that the key is really good training and supported employment and customized employment. Um, so if someone is really well trained and versed in how to do a good you know, assessment and discovery, get to know that individual, what their you know, skills and abilities are, what the best environment will be for them. Um, combined with you know, employer engagement and lo knowing how to approach those employers and sort of uh, negotiating or carving a job for that person, if that's really done effectively, then they're going to be happy in that job and we won't see them coming back. So I think that training is really key because uh, we don't talk, you know, we use terms like conversion and transformation rather than closure because we really want this to be a, a transition of services, not just closing a sheltered workshop, but transitioning from sheltered employment to good community based employment. Thank you. Uh, one more question. So, Ms. DeSantis, I was very impressed that Melwood was really looking at the full picture of what does it cost to actually implement this program and particularly with the cost of doing this kind of testing. Uh, are you aware, have there been other studies or other uh, companies who have looked at it this way and what have they come up with? Specifically about the time trials. Time um, trials are just, you know, does it make economic sense yeah, to... Um, I'm not aware of other studies that have been done. Um, we needed the justification to go to our board and say, hey, you know, this is, first of all, it's not right, but here's, and here's the numbers. This is what it's going to take for us to make that transition. Uh, and so we undertook the study, and that was part of the reason why it took us you know, a couple of years to do the phase in, and we just didn't, you know, couldn't do it immediately because we needed to know what it was going to take and, you know, how to how to get there. Um, so, but I'm not aware of any other studies that have been done at this point. Mm -hmm. And you feel that actually without having to work within the 14C system that you've now been able to thrive? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the impact on our morale, not, not just for the employees who were affected by the increased wages, but the employees around them as well, who, you know, it sort of creates a much more equal um, uh, environment for all of us. Um, and you know what? It's really enhanced teamwork and, you know, pitching in to help each other when needed. Um, I, I should note that we also have vocational support services that we offer to about 700 of the 1,000 employees who have a, a, a specific diagnosis. Um, and that also helps as well. And that helps our managers who are managing employees of differing abilities to be able to understand maybe what's going on or to work through a challenging period or if there's a, a breakdown of some sort, our voc support people are able to step in. So that's made a huge difference, but in terms of the, you know, the raising the salaries and the, um, um, and I, I just think it really goes to the um, sense of self-worth that, you know, you and I are doing the same job. I should be, maybe I'm a little bit slower, but I, we're still doing the same job and we're getting it done. And um, I, I think there's a lot of value in that and we believe it's really impacted our bottom line. And how did you get the parents to buy in? Um, you know, uh, so, um, the vast majority of the people were already working for us, and so I, I think the parents felt felt safe with Melwood. Um, we have a good support system. We've always had a good support system in place for all for our workers. So, um, I, and I don't know that that was a, a big challenge at all. Um, you know, there there we have great benefits as well, and they've been able to have benefits uh, just like the rest of us. And so, in terms of health insurance and, like I said, retirement contributions and everything else, you know, it's really the 
you know, it's the big picture. And I think the parents are happy um, that their son or daughter really could have a future and, and could be working toward independence. And um, I know I always look at the uh, any of the situations I come across in my entire career of social services. If this were my child or my loved one, what would I want? And that's the approach that we've taken. And uh, it seems to have worked. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner Degway. Thanks for the testimony. Um, I have a question, Mr. Daig, about the Vermont experience. Uh, what were those stats again with 53 percent that are, are not yet employed? Is, is, is well, many of them are looking for work. They're in the sort of the job development process, or they may have chosen not to, to pursue employment at this point. So I'm trying to figure out how, how that stat relates to the stat we heard from another panelist about the Vermont experience being two times above than more than two times above the national average in employment after abolition. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, 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 are these like different stats that are swimming around? I'm just trying to understand what the experience is. Well, the national average is just very low. Yeah, the national That's one answer. <laughs> the, the na national average of employment is about 19 or 20 percent of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, so, so the 47 then is that number because because it's so low elsewhere. Yes. Okay. And uh, earlier we heard, and I, I'll broaden this to the, to the rest of the panel. Earlier we heard some uh, testimony about a concern about moving away from the 14C regime and the impacts it would have on a certain age demographic that participates in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if folks have any experience or reaction to, to the concern that stepping away from 14C could, in effect, leave certain populations stranded or without adequate uh, alternatives? Uh, well, I would refer to the, the first report by the National Council on Disability that was, came out in 2012. They came out a set, a set of recommendations um, saying to target sort of the, the newer folks first, you know, people that have been there, you know, for the shortest amount of time, you know, target them for supported employment um, first, and then the, the second, third, you know, that have been there the long, you know, the you know, middle amount of time to target them second, um, because you are going to have that the third group, which is probably more retirement age, and we saw that. Um, with the last sheltered workshop in Vermont that some of these folks were, you know, had been in their you know, workshop for their lives. So they weren't really looking for community-based employment. They were looking for more of a retirement plan. Um, so that's one recommendation I would have, take it kind of in those stages. Um, I've recommended like a three to five year, uh, you know, plan for converting a sheltered workshop. Did others want to get into Yeah, if I, if I could just add to that, because um, in the earlier testimony we were discussing, you know, what about folks who are 45, 50 plus, and, and one of the things that we need to consider I, is... I object to that being characterized as old. <laughs> <laughs> just for the Older. Record. Didn't Based I say older? Right. 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 I'm in the... Well, yeah, I, anyway. I, I join you in that objection. <laughs> That, that's fair. Um, but one of the things I think we need we need to look at, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of all the, co the questions we've had around transition age youth, we have so much more in place for young folks through um, special education services, um, under IDEA, through, um, through PREATS in WIOA. There's a lot more in place to help folks who are younger transition. To, to the point that was made earlier, what about folks who did not benefit from that? And I think that's one of the reasons why, I, I'll speak for APSI, um, we we appreciate the approach of the Transformation to Competitive Employment Act because it recognizes that we need to think about this in a purposeful way. There are some folks that may want to retire with dignity from what they have considered to be work up until that point. And, you know, who are we to say that that's not a viable option when they did not benefit from the laws and the opportunities that we now offer for youth? Yes. Oh. Okay. And then Ms. DeSantis. Um, and I would just add, I think that has generally been uh, a favored approach to focus on folks who are younger and have not, you know, had many years of experience where they have, you know, sort of gotten used to um, working in a, a certain setting and, you know, coming to tell them, uh, see, you know, now you're, you, we want you to do something else or we're offering you something else. It's, it's always more difficult, I think, for, for people to make choices um, about things that seem harder to invent vision because they've lived their whole lives a certain way. Um, however, I do think that it's important, just as it has been in transformations of service systems uh, with living settings.
things and what we offer people to not abandon those folks either because um, you know it may take more conversations it may take more assistance in helping people to envision what life could be um, what it would mean to work um, what it could look like more uh, visits in the community um, more engagement with peers with people who are working with people who have been in their situation but as anybody who has done um, sort of systems change will tell you I think some of the the most the people who've benefited the most and the people who um, really whose lives change the most are in a good way are people who initially were resistant or reluctant um, people who couldn't envision it people who needed a lot of help and so I would say that yes while I think people often will focus on what sometimes people call low-hanging fruit or people who it would be an easier transition for, an easier conversation with, um, we should not abandon um, the folks for whom it might be uh, more challenging. As, as a service provider, um, I, I um, would like to offer a couple of thoughts. Um, so we are an employment uh, agency as well as a service provider. And on the service side, we focused a lot on transitioning youth. Um, the young people coming out of school today, this generation has, their expectations are so much greater and their parents' are, expectations are so much greater than the generation before them, clearly, maybe even the half generation before them. And they, they have grown up with cell phones and iPads and um, computers and, and smart TVs and all of this. And so um, we have to, I I think it's incumbent upon us as service providers to think about what does that future for them look like? What could it look like? One of the things that Melwood is piloting now is um, um, a program we call the Bill IT, which is we've partnered with um, an online um, cybersecurity um, technology training program and wrapped our rehabilitative services and our pre ETS type of programming around that to teach young people, or any, any, it's open to anyone, but it's primarily the younger ones who have accessed it, um, to be able to take certifications for getting into the IT field. As a, we started in the spring, we've had, um, I'm gonna say we have, we've maybe had about 40 people go through it now, about so far, about half have gotten, have gotten their, more than half have gotten their certifications. Half of them have gotten a job or decided they just wanted to go on to college. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we have to think about for our young people. We also, it, it, uh, I believe it's incumbent upon us to think about where is the workforce in general going and what is the impact of the gig economy, um, you know, remote work and all of those kinds of things that at any age one could do. But again, it goes to the point of much older folks that we've been uh, working with maybe have not had the access to computers and the, or the um, the ability to um, to really be able to engage in that. But let me tell you about this older group of uh, women that we have in our Waldorf location, Waldorf, Maryland. We call them the super sewers. It's a group of women, I'm gonna say the average age is probably, maybe maybe in the 50s somewhere. Um, and they their, their caregiver, their group caregiver, um, taught them how to sew a number of years ago. And today they make quilts and blankets and, and placemats and pillowcases and all of these things and then they sell them at bazaars and things and then they get paid for that so it's sort of that um, you know that's the the way of the future it's sort of the Etsy model I call it you know this so there are a lot of creative ways we can think about helping our individuals move not only into competitive integrative employment but into the gig economy and into new ways of working that is affecting all of us in the workplace and I think it's incumbent upon us as as sort of the helpers in this situation to enable uh, families and individuals to think about something different, a different way of what their future might look like. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Christensen, um, you say that um, APSI was the first advocacy organization to call for the phase out. Um, of uh, Section 14C, and so I was just wondering uh, why it is that you, I think I've heard the answer to this, but why is it that your organization chose to um, 
elect a phase-out model rather than um, abolish calling for um, the abolishment of 14C all altogether. And, and, and just to be clear, I, we're one of. Okay. Right. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to go on the record. Okay. I have All no right. idea who said it first. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but but regardless, it's an excellent question. And I you know I think from APSI's perspective, we as an organization we came into existence through the lens of supported employment, um, and there's a recognition that this takes time. And so when we we think about um, the reasons why folks may not be working, um, you know our our members are experts in in doing this our you know our members are the ones who have figured out how to make it happen which was discussed earlier that doesn't make it easy but that it can happen um, you know whether it's better training better technology better um, resources better job fit I mean all of those things play into um, play into the equation but what our members would also recognize is that we don't have a service system that is currently funded and currently has the capacity to to reach the goals that we want. So if we wave a magic wand, let's just say, and 14C is not our reality when we wake up tomorrow morning, there would be people with nowhere to go because the service system is not yet prepared to provide the level of supports um, that are needed for every single person to have access to competitive integrated employment. That does not mean we should not be working towards that goal. And that's what I thought I heard. Um, that's the answer I thought I heard to the question. Well, thank you for letting uh, me clarify. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what you've said here is a testament to the complexity of, of, of this issue. Um, uh, you can see why folks would argue, um, you know, there ought to be a choice. Um, and uh, while um, Paying, integrating folks fully might, I mean, it would be the perfect solution as I think the governor or somebody mentioned, um, you know, not, let's not let uh, what the perfect um, destroy or uh, the, the good, the or, good. Or, or, or whatever. But um, I was wondering about expectation, managing expectations. Um, and so if someone could talk to me about, you know, I heard one time how uh, when a child sees more or sees better, he or she wants better, wants more. And so that, that's related to expectations. But as we uh, move away from 14C, um, can someone talk to me about um, managing the, the expectations, getting parents some are already uh, wanting more and seeing um, more and better for their students as they transition from high school. And then there are others that, that might not quite be there. Uh, but any that wish, um, please talk to us about expectations and the role that, that expectations plays in this, um, this issue. So I, I think it's an excellent question, and and what I would say in return is that I think you know I think the systems rise to meet expectations, and what we don't have right now is that high expectation that this is what we should be expecting for every U.S. citizen. We have too many avenues that allow for us to say except for this person. So so pardon me, I, I call myself a true inclusionist in the sense that you know we're we're really good at saying we believe in the inclusion of everybody except when, except when we're worried about their safety, except when we're worried about fill in the blank. And if we are going to be an inclusive society, then that means that we have to all inherently own that we have exactly the same expectations for all citizens, regardless of whether or not disability is part of that equation. I think about um, the uh, expectations we had of women in science over the years. When I was coming up, women in business, women in science. We, And then think about today, the emphasis on um, STEM uh, for girls and Girl Scout troops and YWCA's and everybody is emphasizing uh, the the STEM, the, the um, science, technology, engineering, and math for girls. It, that goes 
directly to your point of expectations, we are saying to those young girls, we expect that you can do this. If you're interested in this, we expect you can do it. And here's how. We're going to help you learn that skill so that if you want a career in science, technology, engineering, and math, you'll be able to find it. To me, it's the same thing. If we expect um, more, if we expect um, that each individual has abilities, as I said in my remarks, we start with the notion that everything, anything is possible. You might need some training, you might need some support, you might need somebody there coaching you and pushing you, and maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's your service provider. But to me, that's the expectation question, and the, we've seen so many examples throughout history. The same thing applies here in my estimation. And I agree. The, we can't start too young with the families. You know, when my niece with uh, Down syndrome was three months old, my sister asked me to come to her, present at her family group. And I do adult, adult employment, so I went and talked about employment services for adults with disabilities, which a lot of people thought was kind of inappropriate for a three-month-old. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But I think it changed a lot of the families' minds from that very start because I was able to show them, you know, individuals with significant disabilities working in the community. I think that changed their expectations. Um, the Kansas University has a family employment awareness training which uh, targets young families, you know, to teach them about, um, you know, raise expectations, teaching them about, about benefits, about employment programs. Um, so they're not thinking about segregated sheltered services. They're starting at a very young age of thinking about life in the community, you know, community-based jobs, um, uh, post-secondary programs like our Think College program. Um, I was at a one conference for Think College uh, and did a panel presentation and there was a mom that was at my table um, who had a five-year-old with Down syndrome and she was at that, came to the conference because she heard about these programs and wanted to know what do I need to do to prepare my son um, to be able to be eligible for a program like this and how do I pay for it? So she was starting at a very young age of raising those expect expectations. I'd Thank like to add, if I can, um, uh, that was that's been a fundamental part of the work we've done in Oregon is is changing expectations. That's a big part of the mar um, the marketing effort that went out and why we targeted individuals and families first was to really help raise expectations. I do want to though tie this back a little bit to the question that was asked earlier uh, because I would say from the experience we've had and um, while yes in terms of uh, older older adults in uh, sheltered work Commissioner shop. Commissioner Degbele's age. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Old, older we, 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 we are protected under federal civil rights law, <laughs> just for the record. Thank you. Um, older adults in these settings. We definitely took the approach that was laid out here by a, a few of my uh, fellow colleagues who were testifying of, you know, focus on the young, uh, younger individuals who have been in these settings, you know, the shortest period of time. What I would say about that, though, is um, it, some of the most exciting transformation stories, individual success stories we have, are actually with the older, with adults who, I I feel in my heart had the expectation that they wanted to work in competitive and great mm -hmm. employment their entire lifetime, but just were not given the avenues or the opportunity to do it. Um, the woman I mentioned earlier in my testimony was is in her 60s, and she got her job last year in 2018. Um, another gentleman uh, in his in his 40s, um, had been in day program and sheltered work for many, many years. His parents really never expected him to get a competitive and integrated job. They looked with, at this whole effort with high suspicion. Um, just a few weeks ago, the father of that uh, gentleman came to Washington to testify in a congressional briefing talking about how his son now is has a job in the community, is making over $11 an hour, and he understands now that the, his son has so much more potential and it's just made a huge improvement in his life. So I think there's valid, um, valid approach to moving this work forward in other states and other systems. People have been in these settings the you know least amount of time. I also don't, I would hope though in doing so we don't give up on the fact that we've got people who are in that older age group who also also want the opportunity to have competitive integrated employment. Thank, Thank you. you. So we are past time, but I think Commissioner Cladney has one last very brief question. My question is very brief. I don't <laughs> know about the answer. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dag and anybody else on the panel, uh, during the time we were doing research uh, for this project, uh, we looked at the state of Maine. 
And uh, they had, uh, apparently, from what I read, some issues and still have some issues uh, regarding the transition. And uh, I understand that the other five states that have transitioned have had a, a, an easier time of it. Do you know what the problems were in Maine and um, if they can be rectified or what the situation is? I'm not entirely sure, but I think you're referring to, I think it's called the Chimes, the, is it the Chimes report that reported on, on Maine's services? I can't they, remember. Yeah, I'm old. And I think that was... <laughs> Very questionable. Yeah. Well, there was a there was a report that said that there were lines at vocational rehabilitation, and long waits because they didn't have enough uh, people at voc rehab to to assist folks, uh, and, and that's all I read. That's okay. all I remember. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure about that, but I think just sort of goes back to what I said earlier. More of that planful conversion, um, just sort of shutting down a workshop and then having people wait in line is not effective use of services. It's sort of like you know, one person at a time and gradually get them out. So, so, are, are you so with that, we will say thank you for this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I very much appreciate your time and we'll be back at 320. Thank you. Talk about, please turn it off, okay? Okay. okay.
button. Okay. Button. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you got me on already. So we'll now proceed to panel five, uh, which is about reform to the 14C program at the federal level. And in the order in which they will speak, our panelists are Representative Glenn Grothman, who is a member of the House Committee on Education and Labor, and Kate McSweeney, who is Vice President of Governmental Affairs and General Counsel at Access, the Voice of Disability Service Providers. Then Anil Lewis, who is the Executive Director of Blindness Initiatives at the National Federation of the Blind. And Brian Collins, who is Senior Manager for Planning, Change Management, and Accessibility at Microsoft. And finally, Regina Klein, who is a partner at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy. Thank you. So, Congressman Grothman, please begin. Um, thank you. I've never been before a hearing exactly like this one. I'm kind of disappointed we're having it here because uh, I've been involved in this issue off and on for many years. I'm a congressman who represents 10 counties in the state of Wisconsin. And in those 10 counties, we right now have 10 active, what I don't know what the politically correct name is right now, work centers. Um, I've toured them all and was a state center. I toured another. So I'm very familiar with 11 of them. Um, I hope you've all toured them and toured several because really you're going to find out more uh, in the first two hours at a work center than you will sitting through here and reading all the legal mumbo jumbo that you're going to get. Um, there are tremendous things to look at because you see people who most of us would think have been dealt a tough lot in life and they're smiling and happy and are so proud to have lives like their siblings and friends. To go to work every day, to earn a paycheck, use that. Usually they're, they're subsidized in other ways because they have different abilities, you know. We have SSI or SSDI programs. So, you know, they don't, they don't have to earn enough to to pay for a $700 a month apartment or anything like that. But they're very proud of the situation that I have, and as a result, I've always kind of considered an advocate for them. Uh, since being involved in this issue, not just 14C, but other issues as well, um, it, it, it stunned me that some of the bureaucrats who have to make decisions on this have never toured the work centers, which is just almost beyond belief, because at least where I'm from in Wisconsin, we have, I would say, there are a couple counties that don't, but we have almost at least one per county, and the larger counties have more than that. And it's scary that people are could ruin ruin the lives of so many people dealt a, dealt a difficult problem without having a chance to tour them. I, I'd almost really rather say I'll step down, let's let's drive a few miles into Virginia or Maryland and look what we have. But but these are my my opinions. Um, all of my ten work centers are nonprofit. Um, the people who work there, if you get to know them, are saints. As I understand it, before I was here, some people were denigrating them a little bit. People who spend their life working with handicapped, working with people who are nonverbal, working with people that have to be toileted, are saints. They are not doing it to make money. They are not doing it to take advantage of people. Okay? And you should be appalled if anybody says anything else about these folks. Um, like I said, the pride in, in, in uh, meeting with these people are tremendous. Uh, we we're actually going to have an award ceremony for them tonight back in Sheboygan. I'm going to miss it because I wanted to testify before you folks. Um, some of the people who work here work in the community a few days a week. 
five or six days a week, and they may en enjoy working that. But a lot of those people who work five or six and um, five or six hours a week are only able to work five or six hours a week. Then they go back to the work center where they get supervision, and they deal with a staff who knows how to manage people who may have a personality problem, may only be able to move one arm, may not be able to hold their head up, uh, that sort of thing. Um, in some of these work centers, 85 to 90 percent of the people work for under minimum wage. If you ever tour a work center, you know exactly why that is, because you are dealing with people who've been dealt a tough lot in life. I mean, you know, if you can only move one arm, if you if you have to hold somebody's head up, um, if you if you have a, a personality thing where you might have a, a fit or something like that, um, it's hard to find an employer who's going to pay seven fifty an hour for that. But in a work center, you can pay them one fifty, two bucks, four bucks an hour, and and uh, together with subsidizing with SSI or SSDI, they can do okay. Um, they are trained or hopefully can work in the community. Some make it, some can't. Some make it um, be for short periods of time because employers will help them a great deal. I think a little bit of the confusion on this issue um, stems from the type of jobs that some of these folks get. I recently toured a, um, there is one of my counties that's trying to shut down their work center. And they invited me as the congressman to a, uh, a place where somebody who had previously worked at a work center had worked, and she was working for eight hours a week. And it was nice to be in the community, and the employer said she's the best employee we ever had, which is what you'd say. And she was very nice to have this young gal. I won't give her name. We'll call her Susie. Very nice. We are so happy to have Susie here. She's the best employee we have. I then talked to the employer in her office, and um, she was very happy to have Susie there, but she had to have somebody, not a not a job coach in the sense that it was paid for by somebody else, but one of her own employees, you know, monitors Susie all the time. She was doing it as a community service, not because Susie had been held back all this time working in a work center. She was doing it as charity. And that is what happens some of the time, and that's fine. We have wonderful businesses in America. Sometimes as charity, a profitable business can take in somebody for four or five hours a week. But one shouldn't get confused when that happens that they were being held back before. You just found a nice business who is their community service would do that. Um, um, I think if you talk to people in facilities like this, um, and they compare it to their job on the outside, uh, some prefer to be in a work center. You are dealing with nice people, continuity. They make friends there for 30, maybe 30 years of their life, both the people with disabilities and the people without the disabilities, um, which is kind of an improvement over maybe a fast food place where you get all new people again and again or may have to look for a new job. If you talk to these folks, they frequently would even prefer the work center. And it offends me that anybody would say we would sh sh shut down the work center with all these happy, productive people because we arrogantly know what will make them happier. You should not take away that option from people. And when you deal with people with these handicaps, once you tour three or four of these, you will very quickly see that no amount of dreaming can say that there's going to be a job that's going to pop up for these people to work 35 hours a week uh, out in the community for seven fifty an hour. It's just not going to happen. I'm struck by a guy recently to a rule you're not dealing with today. He uh, was borderline quadriplegic. I ran into him and his dad. He was told, he's probably making a buck an hour. He was told for certain reasons he couldn't work at the work center anymore. He was crushed. He's actually above average intelligence. But this was his life for the last seven or eight years. And his job Thank was you, every bit as important. Your, your time is up, but we'll look forward to questions. Okay. Ms. McSweeney. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm going to, uh, can you hear me? If you push talk, we'll be able to hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
I'm not going to take you up on your invitation to not read my statement aloud because I've noticed all day that you had read the statements. I do encourage anybody who's watching, though, to um, find it on our website. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of what we've heard today in addition to what we had in the statement. My name is Kate McSweeney. I am the uh, Vice President of Government Affairs and General Counsel for Access. We represent disability service providers from across the country. Um, I am what was referred to earlier as um, the sheltered workshop lobby. But <laughs> there's something wrong with that because I don't even know what sheltered workshop means. I got involved in this about four years ago. I was I had a great job as a lawyer and uh, sort of inadvertently um, started doing a little bit of work for access and really fell in love with the issues and the people and ended up leaving my law firm, taking a massive pay cut, coming to access and taking on this role. So I'm proud, I'm proud to lobby for them. I'm not a lobbyist by profession, I've never lobbied before. I was in broadcasting for 22 years and then I became a litigator. Um, now suddenly I'm a registered lobbyist but on one issue and it's, it is the issues that relate to people with disabilities and the services that they need and the providers, so many of the providers um, who provide those services. I want to talk about um, what you didn't get to hear today because there were so many people who wanted to talk about from one perspective and it's a lot of opinion. The people you haven't heard from are the people who are working under certificates. The people who are really concerned about their jobs. The people that the congressman was referring to, but who I see in every state, because I travel and visit work centers everywhere. The work centers that um, some people describe today, I don't recognize that. I see uh, places that are really no different from the places that I worked at times in my life and spent a lot of time in. I see people who are so incredibly dedicated to serving the people who are working there, people who take incredible pride in their work, uh, both as the providers and the people who are working there who are receiving services at the same time, have jobs. Some people make more than minimum wage, some people make less than minimum wage. Some people split up their day and do uh, perhaps do competitive work in the morning and then maybe do a day program in the afternoon. There's a lot of accommodation to help people live full and robust lives. And um, there are a lot of denigrating things said today that I find very concerning because that should not, uh, that shouldn't be part of the discussion. We should all have aspirational goals and we certainly support all of them at Access. We are all about expanding options, expanding choice, um, increasing assistive technology, making sure that people ha have every opportunity that they would like. What we don't want to see are opportunities taken away to meet what somebody else thinks is best for people. And a number of people talked about eliminating 14C immediately. If you were to eliminate 14C immediately, you would throw an awful lot of people out of work. Now, the government, um, the Congressional Budget uh, Office gave, they did a review of the Raise the Wage Act, which uh, Chairman Scott had mentioned earlier today. Seems like a long time ago now. Um, and he spoke of, um, he spoke of Raise the Wage and the fact that Raise the Wage would eliminate 14, it would phase out 14C. But the, but the CBO said, they use the number 125,000 people. There are 125,000 people working under a certificate right now. Some of those people are making more than minimum wage. But let's say 125,000 is the right number. Why are we sitting here arguing over keeping or killing the jobs of 125,000 people who want to keep their job? Why are we talking about expanding options, working together? how we can find common ground. That's what the advocacy community should be doing. I want to do a shout out to um, Julie Christensen at APSI. Many of our members are also APSI members. That might surprise people. But we found common ground. We found things to work on together because there is so much to talk about. We don't necessarily agree on 14C. We don't have to agree. We just, everybody in the advocacy community should be pulling in one direction. But this has become so poisonous. But what are we really talking about? People having jobs, people having the dignity of work, and people working in, often in work centers, 
where they also have a lot of other opportunities, receive a lot of other services, and have job coaching, supported employment, have the opportunity to expand their horizons with the help of the community rehabilitation programs. Because one of the things that I want to make really clear is if, if community rehab programs cease to exist, you would have to reinvent them because they are really necessary. Having people in every community, in communities in every state across the country who really are knowledgeable, who really are experienced, it blows me, I'm sorry, I'm going to just use a colloquialism and say it blows me away when I spend time with the, with the people who are um, the providers across the country that make up Access as members. They are the most impressive people I've ever met, the most caring, the most concerned, and they have been depicted in a terrible way over the last few years. Really a fire hose has been turned on them by the government and by so many of the advocacy communities, and it couldn't be more wrong. So I want to I want to underscore what the congressman said, who we so appreciate, um, and, and encourage you to visit a CRP. And if there isn't one near you, if you don't know one, call me. We'll, we'll be happy to make all the arrangements. It's so important. It is just vitally important that you do that. I want to end on, on uh, two notes. Um, one is something that one of our that a, a provider in Connecticut said to me the other day, and we were talking about community. And she said, community isn't about geographic location. It's about the people. And that's so true. We have to start letting people with disabilities thrive where they want to thrive, not where we think they should be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. McSweeney. Mr. Lewis? First of all, thank you for the opportunity <clears throat> to, to testify today. Um, my name is Anil Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of Blindness Initiatives for the National Federation of the Blind. And I want to share on a personal level here and a professional level, um, because I can present on this topic from those different perspectives as a family member of a person with a disability, a consumer of services, a provider of those services, and an advocate to improve those services. Um, just really quickly, it's in my written testimony, but I'll go over <clears throat> my sibling story is what I call it. My uh, older brother, my older sister, and myself are all blind. Uh, but my brother lost his vision, <coughs> excuse me, much earlier in his life. He was in elementary, maybe high school at the time. And really bright guy, uh, went to the school for the blind in Macon, Georgia, uh, where they didn't really teach him any blindness skills because he just had just enough vision where he could read large print, but retina retinitis pigmentosis, the disease that took our eyesight, is a degenerative disease, so it progressively got worse. Um, but the long story short is he did not receive any real quality education. He went into the VR system, and rather than dealing with his blindness and teaching him alternative skills of blindness, uh, they tried to place him as a filing clerk. Um, he had to have bottle-bottom glasses, a lighted magnifier, and he had to go and retrieve files and read this information from these prints in, his, in a dark room. So, I mean, it was... He failed. Um, and then the VR agency ended up referring him to the Georgia Industries for the Blind, which is a sheltered workshop. And they counted that as a win. Yeah. And my brother uh, was employed. Uh, so comparing that to, and I'll bring it all together hopefully, my sister who lost her sight much later. Um, she was in college at the time when she lost her vision. So she had gotten a lot of her education. Uh, she also did not get any real blindness skills. She didn't learn how to read Braille, didn't learn how to travel independently with white cane, didn't learn how to use access technology. And she had aspirations of being a lawyer, uh, but instead, um, VR, um, she got involved, ended up working at the industry. So now I have two siblings working at the Georgia Industries for the Blind. I was 25 years old when I lost my sight. Uh, it happened fairly, fairly quickly over the weekend. Uh, I was in college working on my bachelor's degree in business administration at the time. I had done a lot of work going back to school, working going back to school so I could pay for college. So luckily I had a lot of different job experiences in a lot of different environments. Uh, but when it happened, I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to the Georgia Industries for the Blind, uh, which at that particular point was a sub wage workshop. Uh, they were paying people peace rate. 
um, they were actually encouraging individuals who are on Social Security not to make more money so that they wouldn't lose their Social Security benefits. Uh, there were no blind supervisors to be had in the place. It just really wasn't a conducive place for people to really be motivated to do better with their lives. But luckily for me, uh, Dean Carol Pearson at Georgia State University, where I was attending at the time, got involved with me, and she showed me a whole different side of what my true potential could be based on the proper intervention and services being put in place. So what happened is I did get some training. I learned how to read Braille. I learned how to travel independently with the long white cane. I learned how to use access technology. And I was able to complete my degree. And because I had gotten so infected with this ability to do these things, I was also able to work with my sister. And she, in turn, went back to VR and said, look, I want to have some training. And she got trained on how to use access technology, et cetera. And she ended up working at a uh, catalog place. Because back then, the, the place to hire and employ blind people was in customer service because the technology showed that you could listen to a customer in one ear and listen to your talking computer in the other ear. So everybody who was blind, that was the job that they were placing everybody in. Uh, that's when we were in, in Vogue, blind people were. And uh, so she got a job there. And long story short, now she's working at the General Services Administration as a financial budget analyst. My brother, unfortunately, by the time I was able to get engaged with him and educate myself about what was important and what was possible, I was able to help my sister because she'd only been in that environment for a short period of time. But my brother, no. It came too late. Uh, he had been institutionalized. He had gotten very comfortable in working in that environment. I still believe that he was much brighter than I, had much more capacity than I, but because he had gotten comfortable, and I have to admit, I think that a little bit afraid, he was reluctant to leave uh, the industries for something better. So I, I, I look at this in a way that I think is real, right? If you don't really address the systems that are in place, uh, that prevent individuals from really getting the training that they need, then yeah, it's inevitable. The Southern Wage Workshop is going to exist as that alternative. Mr. Lewis, just at your request, I'm giving you a time notice that you have a little less than two minutes left. Wow, that went really quickly. <laughs> but you have, you have a little less than two minutes. Quick, go. Okay. Um, I found the National Federation of the Blind knows that blindness is not the characteristic that defines me or my future. And every day we raise expectations because low expectations create obstacles between low pe blind people and our dreams. So the National Federation of the Blind told me that I could do this. And in the instance where blindness was in the past a reason to have people employed at some of the wages, now people say no, that's not the case. But now they say it for other disabilities. My real confession is I ended up being a service provider. I brought people in, I gave them the tours of the center. I made them think that it was a wonderful place. We finally shut the place down. We, we got everyone in there a competitive integrated employment job and I am just sitting here really feeling sad about what I perpetuated in doing those tours to give this particular perspective to the congressman because there is a better alternative and if people who are doing the training actually possess the skills to do it because that's the data that's missing here we're not evaluating how many people who are providing these services actually have training and skills to provide them but when people do then the positive outcomes emerge thank you guys for the time I appreciate it thank you Mr. Collins. My name is Brian Collins, uh, and I'm a senior manager at Microsoft in Redmond, Washington. And uh, I'd like to thank the Commission uh, for the opportunity to share with you my responsibility, which is supported employment. Our mission at Microsoft is to empower every individual and every organization on the planet to achieve more. That includes the one billion people with disabilities around the world. We believe that people with disabilities are a strength for our company and a talent pool that adds not just diversity, but expertise that make our products, our services, and our culture better. Under this guiding principle, over the last several years, we've launched employment programs focused on bringing the untapped talent of people with disabilities. One of those programs is our supported employment program, which is run by our real estate and facilities group. <clears throat> Since the program started in 2013, over 280 supplier positions have been filled by individuals with intellectual and development disabilities on Microsoft campuses globally. And that number is steadily growing. The learnings have been immense, and we, it has helped shape our approach to external staffing. Uh, 
We share these learnings with our supplier base of over 30,000 organizations globally. At the Microsoft headquarters in Redmond, we have approximately 50,000 employees and visitors that com come to the campus every day. Essentially, it's a small city. The Real Estate and Facilities Group deliver services for employees through 50 different vendor companies. These include maintenance, food services, utilities, landscaping, mailroom services, uh, <clears throat> and more. This service-based campus environment creates an opportunity for us to have a real impact in the community in which we live. In 2013, as we created the Supported Employment Program to provide people with intellectual and developmental disabilities the opportunity to obtain and maintain employment. This program includes a host of strategies that help bring and support these individuals into jobs within the Microsoft environment. Our practices include inclusive interviewing and hiring practices, working with job coaches, and of course job customization and providing accommodations. And the success of the program does depend on strong partnerships with local vendors and community organizations. The mission of the program is simple. Partner with suppliers and local employment agencies to make a substantial difference in the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who, who have historically been overlooked in the jobs market. To date, the program has resulted in external staff with disabilities being employed in full and part-time roles across 30 different job types. All employees are paid the going rate for their work. All of the workers hired by our suppliers earn a competitive wage and receive benefits from their employers in full and part-time roles. <clears throat> this is in line with our mission to empower everyone and our values of inclusion. However, today in parts of the US, people with disabilities can be paid less than minimum wage or sub-minimum wage, sometimes as little as pennies on the, on the dollar. Microsoft does not pay less than the applicable minimum wage. We require our suppliers to do the same because we believe in fair wages for all. In July 2019, additional language was added to our supplier code of conduct to reconfirm the obligation to pay at least applicable minimum wage to everyone. Employment of people with disabilities, including those with intellectual disabilities, is the right thing to do and it's a business imperative. It's good for the bottom line. Research shows that companies that champion disability inclusion are more profitable. According to the 2018 Accenture report, companies that have improved their inclusion of persons with disabilities were four times more likely to have a total shareholder return that outperforms those of their peer group. But numbers are only part of the story. People with disabilities are a strength. There are many examples of employees with disability, disabilities who are more loyal, reducing the cost of turnover, the cost of recruitment, and the cost of onboarding. We've seen employees with disabilities who are more innovative. They challenge the status quo. They invent inclusive solutions. We've seen employees with disabilities teaching their colleagues about communication, inclusion, and empathy. Equally important is the impact that hiring will have on the life of somebody who faces barriers to employment. With the, unemployed for, <clears throat> excuse me, with the unemployment rate for people with disabilities, that is twice that of the national average. The opportunity is real and the opportunity is now. Microsoft is committed to disability employment and we are committed to helping other employers along the way. We have presented information about our partnerships, our lessons learned, and the benefits of supported employment at various trade fairs. Our efforts to spread the word have included individual meetings with multiple companies, both large and small. And we talk with those who are interested in particularly diversifying their workforces. Microsoft is not alone. For example, earlier this year, a sportswear company in the Pacific Northwest started their own supported employment program. We are just one of a growing community of employers who understand that disability employment is good values and it's good for business. 
To support this information of best practice sharing, Microsoft has created a toolkit and videos, all of which are available online to everybody. Microsoft is committed to continuing to grow and, um, and improve our supported employment program, as well as talking to other businesses about reaching out to and removing barriers to employment for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We are committed to paying the market wage to people, including those with disabilities, and we require our suppliers to pay the same market wage as well. We believe in fair wages for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Ms. Klein? Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to participate in today's proceedings. I'm currently a partner at the law firm of Brown Goldstein and Levy in Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., and before that, I was senior counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Department of Justice. Prior to that, I was a DOJ trial attorney, and in that role as a DOJ trial attorney, I was lead counsel on two cases, the United States versus Rhode Island and the United States versus Rhode Island and City of Providence, um, that sought to challenge unnecessary and unjustified segregation under Title II of the ADA and the Olmstead versus LC Supreme Court decision, and resulted in the nation's first statewide settlement agreements, implementing the promise of Olmstead LC to move individuals from segregated shelters workshops to competitive integrated employment. In addition, during the same period of time, I was counsel of record with many of the folks that you've heard from earlier today, uh, lawyers, we brought the Lane v. Kitzhaber United States versus Oregon case, similarly under the promise of Title II of the ADA and Olmstead versus LC, um, and likewise, that resulted in a landmark settlement agreement that moved thousands of people, that will move thousands of people over the next 10 years from segregated sheltered workshops to competitive integrated employment. Together, these these three cases um, resulted in injunctions that 11, over 11,000 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities will move over the next decade from segregated sub-minimum wage labor into real jobs in the community. Over the past eight decades, Americans with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are blind with other significant disabilities have been left out of the marketplace. They've just been left out. And they often earn just pennies an hour in these settings, in these sheltered workshop settings, based on one erroneous, one primary and principal erroneous assumption, and that is that disability inherently creates insurmountable obstacles to work. And the premise behind that is thereby it must justify downwardly adjusting wages because disability is per se a reason to do so. And yet we know better. We know uh, that the reality of the ADA, the promise of the ADA, is that it disabused us of this very notion, that it's axiomatic under the ADA, that it is the work environment for which we make modifications. It is not the person that we remove from the work environment. It is the barriers in the work environment that we remove. In fact, the earlier law, the predecessor law to the Americans with Disabilities Act, 1973's Rehab Act, said the same thing. It created a vocational rehabilitation system premised on the idea that there may be people in our country that require supports more than that which would be reasonable for an employer to provide. And in those instances, those supports will be provided on the job, in the community. Nevertheless, as a result of the failure of the 14C provision to keep speed with these other sensational laws that have brought civil rights to so many Americans, it's out of step. It didn't adapt to these lessons that are formative in these other statutes. And as a result, it's trapped millions of Americans now and in the future with the reality of living in the past, whether it be living in 1938 whether it be living in the 1973 Rehab Act reality or whether it be living in pre-1990, we know that the lessons of the ADA have not been incorporated into the way that we currently implement 14C. And I gotta tell you, we've heard people say that these are opinions. I'm here to say it's not an opinion, it's law. And we should take seriously civil rights laws because th that's why we're here. This is a matter of civil rights. And we have a federal statute that's out of step with our foremost laws in this country for people with disabilities. And we need to take action 
to, to bring 14C into step with current reality. So accord, accordingly, we can no longer take the time to debate the merits of whether the 14C program needs better enforcement. We, we don't need additional study to know that it's out of step with current federal civil rights laws. Um, we've got to dive deep. We have to dig deep into solutions. Let's shift today from a discussion about principally whether there's a problem to how we're going to solve the problem with efficacy and responsibility to the people who deserve jobs in the community. Make no mistake, objective evidence has established for decades that the program is ineffective, that it's lacking in oversight, that people in it are poor, displaced, underemployed, and that it's out of step with the reality of other people who are working in real jobs in the community with the same or similar disabilities as those who work in 14C settings. Federal law, macroeconomic trends, and the preferences of people with disabilities and their families are changing and have shifted dramatically towards competitive integrated employment over a relatively short period of time, but in a long march over progressively over the last 80 years without any significant changes for decades to the Section 14C program. To do nothing is absolutely not an option, even in the relatively short term, because the macroeconomic trends in the country are indicating that everyone else in our workforce system is training for 21st century jobs. And yet, I, these are not opinions. I have visited workshops in many states for many years. And people are performing labor on machines that do not exist anywhere else in the market. They are receiving equipment as donations because the equipment is no longer pertinent to jobs that exist elsewhere. For people with disabilities, they then use that equipment to make products um, outside the bounds of any technology. What people are doing in the workshops that I've visited are mostly rote, highly repetitive labor, usually by hand, quite often without reasonable accommodations, without assistive technology, without augmentative or alternative communication. And as I've just mentioned, using evidently outdated equipment and production processes that you won't see anywhere else. This is the case even though people with disabilities in the workshops are indeed capable of performing just as well as their non-disabled peers with accommodations and the right equipment, the right individualized services and supports. Thank you, Ms. Klein. I'm going to open up for questions from my fellow commissioners in just a moment, but Congressman Grothman, I want to start uh, by telling you that I take exception to some of your terminology. My brother has cerebral palsy, and I want you to know that no one in my family ever considered anybody who ever worked with him or with our family a saint. We consider those people to be people who had jobs that were fulfilling, and I'm grateful that they had them. I'm grateful for what they did. But my brother has made seven, more than $7.50 an hour well since high school in every job he has ever held. He is not distinguishable from the person you described who can only move one arm. And I, I want to make sure that you know that this bureaucrat is intimately familiar with the issues that you describe as we consider this issue. And with that, I'll open for questions for my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Congressman, Biden. I apologize to you on behalf of the commission. That was rude. And I feel very good about letting you know how I felt about what you said. Right. Um, well, am I supposed to respond to that? You're welcome to respond. Would you like to? Okay. Um, you should turn your microphone on so that we can get it for the record. I will, I will emphasize again the importance of having this committee or commission tour um, work centers on their own. I think every work center I have toured, and I have toured many of them, have examples of people who have moved out of the work center and are working for minimum wage or more in the community. And you've heard other examples here today. But I think if you tour all the work centers, you will find people who will not be able to succeed in the community. And I think of the tens of thousands of people whose future, their lives, are going to be dependent upon what this group says. And if you make what at least I think is the wrong decision, you can ruin the lives of tens of thousands of people. 
it is possible that we can do more, for example, with blind people or more with people with certain disabilities. However, everybody who I have talked to who've worked in the 12 workshops that I tour regularly um, feels very strongly, despite the fact that they try to work with people, despite the fact they try to train people, there are some people who will not find a job in the community for 30 or 35 hours a week. And I beg you to pay, um, I beg you to tour these centers because you do have the ability to, as I see it, ruin the lives of tens of thousands of people with your decision. I'm sure you've heard testimony today of individuals who worked in a work center and moved on. And that is one of the goals of the work center. And every one of the work centers I tour have done that. But just as there are some people who have moved on, there are some people who aren't going to find it possible to move on. And for those people, their life is going to work every day and earning that one or two or three dollars an hour. And if you take away that option from them, you have the potential to ruin their lives. Um, it is a free country. And guardians or people with these uh, handicaps, they can look for other jobs and good work centers work for other jobs. But I beg you not to take that option away from them and treat them as something less than a free human being. And I think if you take the time to tour three and work, four work, sh work centers for all of you, I assume you're from all over the country, I think, uh, I think you are going to find very wonderful employees working there, both, both you know, people doing all sorts of jobs in those centers. You're going to find a lot of continuity, and you have to ask yourself, what is going to happen to all of these people if I decide automatically that these people um, can't work here anymore? And, and I beg you to do that. I don't know whether as part of your, your responsibility here you are required to go out and see the work centers, but you'll learn a lot more from the work centers than you will a battery of lawyers or a battery of politicians talking today. Thank and you I very beg much. you to do that because I can see you ruining a lot of lives if you make the wrong decision. Thank you for that modified approach. And I, I don't disagree with you that it would be beneficial for us to, to visit work centers. You thank you. I have not seen a lot of them, and I, and I welcome the invitation. So thank you very much for the, for the suggestion. Ma thank you. Ma Madam, Madam Chair, Mr. just one, one clarification for the record. So, um, Congressman, this, this body makes re issues reports. They contain findings. They make recommendations. The duty, I think, as you know, to uh, reflect on federal law is charged with the Congress of the United States. And so we have, but since 1957, been here to advise the nation on um, potential reforms in the area of civil rights uh, as an educative function and advisory body. But it is the Congress of the United States that um, has the decision-making power in the context of your comment to determine what the federal law of the United States is. And so what we're trying to do today is receive information from yourself. Uh, earlier, one of your colleagues from across the aisle was here sharing some views about some bills that he has pending to explore these issues in some detail and then determine if we can put out a report that explores them based on a range of opinions. And, and we welcome your um, charge to us to try and get out and see some of the facilities. I think it's worthwhile. I, I will make the personal effort. I note also for the record that we're limited by our budgetary allocation. There are lots of things we would like to go see in the, in the country when we study these issues. We, we, we do what we can in that regard. But the points are well taken. Seeing is is one way to gather information, um, but I, I just wanted to make the record clear about what that we're, we're not deciding. We're making recommendations. In a sense, you and your colleagues are deciting. Right. And just to understand. If you just took, put the talk button on your phone, then we can hear you. It's not going to take you money. At least in Wisconsin, we have one in I think all but three counties in the state. I don't know what state you're from, um, but you know it shouldn't take an overnight big deal. I think if you poke around, most people here will find one with a half hour of their house. Commissioner Clady. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Congressman, thank you for coming. Uh, Ms. McSweeney, both of you may want to answer this question or anybody else on the panel. Uh, matter of fact, every question I ask, anybody can chime in. Uh, 
You describe people working for 35, 30, 35 hours a week at the work centers. Um, how many people in the work centers actually do that versus working 20 hours a week, do, going to day services, I mean, that kind of mix? I mean, there should be some statistics this morning. I think Ms. McSweeney was here, and she heard me. I did a calculation on somebody's certification um, application where there were 160 people who made $0 an hour. Um, so they're not all working all the time. Some are just merely present. Uh, some are in therapeutic day services. I'm, I'm just trying to get a picture of this. I, I, I was very struck by that because I wanted to, we talked about it, uh, some, some of the people here have come to provide some comments later. Who Could I you push the talk button on your microphone? Thank I'm you. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, we were chatting. Some of the people have come to make some comments, some of the public comments later, and I hope you'll all be here to hear them because they've traveled quite a long way. Uh, this is such an important issue, but you were talking about people earning zero dollars an hour. Or three cents so or it, five cents. You know, people throw those numbers around. Nobody makes zero dollars an hour. That would be illegal. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that we're asking for the panel to get behind is really to encourage Congress to do a real study on, on what really happens if people lose these jobs. A lot of times, that you heard a lot of really opinion and uh, some sort of unfounded commentary today. Not a lot of people here, not, not a balanced program at all. I mean, you know that. You did the invitations, and Nick has been great to work with, uh, and I appreciate his kindness and the staff here. Um, but there were, what, 25 people who, who came to provide testimony, and two are supporting, um, pro continuing to provide a vast and full array of options for people. I don't, I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that question, Commissioner. I think that if you, it's also personalized in terms of people having their own individualized plan when they work in a work center. So they might work a half day and do a half day of, of, of quality day programming. They might do a half day at making competitive wage uh, outside somewhere else and come back uh, to the work center in the afternoon and work or do a day program. They might split things up because they're not having a good day, so they might take a break and go work, uh, go spend time in a day program. It really does vary very much by the individual. Commissioner, uh, Congressman. Yeah, I think one of the things, at least in, in this group, you've got a continuum of people. You've got a people who are going to work their way out and make 15 bucks an hour, and you've got people who are very, very, very disabled. And you know, the, I, I think some of these people maybe you maybe can work an hour a day, and that's one of the reasons why I want you to, to tour these, because they're people who imply that everybody in society is going to find, you know, 40 hours a week at minimum wage, and if you tour these places, you can find some, but you're going to find people who are very, very severely disabled, and that's a sad thing. But it's just a reality, and if, if you're operating one of these things, you may be able only to get an hour or two a day out of some folks. No, I just want to some folks you're going to get 30 hours. It's just you've got a continuum of disabled is such a, a an all-encompassing term. You know, it means such a wide variety of people, and you're kind of putting them all together in one group, like we can do, you know, everything with this, treat everybody the same, and they're so widely varied. Like I said, there are people who are, you know, incredibly disabled. You got to think about that before you kick them out. You wanted to comment? Yes, I, I just I can have the opportunity to re respond to the congressman just on one small point. Um, you know, we don't know is the answer. You asked a question: Do you have data about how much time people are working in workshops? And the answer is we don't know. And we should know, because we suspect from all the people that we represent and all the thousands of people that we hear from regularly that are in workshops, that they're bored, that there is no minimum performance expectation, that there is no training, that there are no standard operating procedures, that there are no accommodations, that there's no discussion of advancement because the world is flat. And so when you're asking, are you working in workshops, it's questionable. 
whether there is work in workshops for much of the day for many of my clients. We should record that information, but even so, we, we have so little data about what people are doing other than an awareness that they're being supervised for eight hours. So when you're seeing a 30.5 hour work week in the workshop and the talking points from the trade association, what they're really saying is individuals with disabilities are being supervised for 30 hours a week. But people who work in the community, they work every hour that they work in the community meaningfully and by choice. Um, when they're engaged in a community job, like you or I, they're engaged. They're not being supervised, they're living their lives with self-determination. Okay, thank you. May I? Yes. Um, Anybody can respond. I, I apologize. I, I wish I would have been able to go first on the panel. I got caught up in my emotions and was able to give the best presentation, but to your question. Um, the data doesn't exist, and I don't necessarily know if we need to be researching that type of data. Uh, one of the things that I, I actually help run an extended workshop is a shelter workshop. We pay people piecemeal rates. Some were, you know, and in actuality, there were some instances when they would come in and they wouldn't do any work and they wouldn't get paid, uh, but we were still getting paid because at that particular time we were getting paid services from the state to have something for them to do. Um, but the thing that, that stands out overall is if we don't start, one, believing first of all that the people have the capacity for competitive employment, then we've already lost. Um, are there some individuals that are going to be more challenging? Absolutely. Uh, in, the, in the conversations I've had with individuals who run the workshops, they say it's expensive and it's difficult. But no one who really is in the space has said it's impossible. So the data we should be looking at is what, what is going to be that cost to implement those implement in innovative systems that create opportunities for those individuals who were previously deemed unemployable to obtain competitive integrated employment? Because there's so many examples of people who have been labeled unemployable that when they're put in an environment with individuals that believe in their capacity, set the expectations, provide the proper training and support, they obtain competitive integrated employment. One of the individuals that was in the workshop that I used to give the tour to, and I did that, brought them in, politicians, look, we're doing a wonderful thing, and they were happy because we made sure there was fun. Uh, but all of them ended up transitioning into jobs that were full-time employment, not just piecemeal stuff that we had when we had it there. But even more importantly, a couple of them actually went out and they started making more money than me. So it wasn't even about competitive integrated employment. They were making more money than I was making. But these were individuals who were deemed that this was the best that they could do to hang out in our workshop all day. And that, that's why I'm so emotionally torn. When I did that, I didn't have any ill intent. I wasn't trying to deny these people an opportunity to obtain competitive and graded. I thought I was doing a wonderful thing. I, I, I was driven by my compassion to provide these opportunities that would otherwise not exist for these people. And it was misguided compassion. And because of my ignorance, because I didn't have the skill set to do what I was supposedly doing, and because of that misguided compassion, these individuals spend a significant part of their lives wasting away in that workshop, making money for our center, but wasting away. So I do have some degree of comfort knowing that I was able to help employ all but one of those individuals that was working in the workshop in a competitive, integrated work environment. And the one person that we weren't, he was a senior gentleman. And we ended up placing him in an environment that had a lot of community support. And I guarantee he was much happier in that environment than he was in the one that we created. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Collins. Uh, it looked like Ms. McSweeney had something to say. No. no. Okay. Oh. I, I could wait. <laughs> Mr. Collins, uh, to change up the subject a little, <laughs> can you, uh, uh, this, you've described uh, your vendor program. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, there's also a direct hire program from Microsoft, isn't there? Yeah, we have a number of programs uh, across the company. Uh, one in particular is the Autism at Work hiring program. And uh, we, we're now hiring individuals that Microsoft has actually overlooked in the past to become software engineers, uh, work side by side with our traditional software engineers. And what we've done there is really changed the doorway into Microsoft. 
uh, we're now looking at doing practical accommodations uh, on examining things like the resume process, the interview process. We're working with our own managers within Microsoft to make them aware of this community that th they've overlooked in the past. And as we get them involved uh, in the interview process, we're training those managers again on how to uh, have a practical interview with a uh, person who's on the autism spectrum. Uh, that interview is not the traditional type of interview that uh, I know I went through at Microsoft. So uh, uh, I, I think we've, we've found that uh, sweet spot and we've opened the door to more people, again, who've been overlooked in the jobs market and who are more than capable uh, to do great work with our company. It's my understanding the interview process you're talking about uh, for the autism program as well as other disabled people that you directly hire is uh, uh, formulated for them. In other words, uh, what their disability is and, and how they react to things. I got to hear you. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, the first thing we do with candidates that we are interviewing now, we ask them, do they need accommodations? Um, within the autism hiring program, uh, we are actually out there and we are looking for candidates who uh, would uh, self-diagnose as being on the autism spectrum. But for all jobs at Microsoft, we're asking people, what accommodations do you need in the interview process? And one last question. Uh, uh, and this is for anybody on the panel. Uh, it doesn't. See, my research seems to show that there has not been a suit brought to challenge 14C on an equal protection basis. Uh, does anybody believe that it's a violation of the Constitution? What's that about? I guess not. Yes. <laughs> if you would just push talk, there you go. Okay. I thought I turned it off and turned it back on. Yes, we believe that. The National Federation of the Blind is toyed with that, and we're in the process of entering into a variety of different lawsuits to address this in different perspectives. But um, there has been no no finding. There has been no closure. We have some active litigation going on now. I'd like to point out something. If you would just push talk. I, yeah, I'd like to point out something. There was a time in our society, I don't know, 70, 90, 100 years ago, in which people with disabilities just sat at home. I can think of one from my lawyer days who I knew it was, she was a great gal, but I mean, she stayed at home with her parents her whole life. And her whole life was sitting there eating, watching TV, and never got out of the house. The sheltered workshops was a huge improvement for these folks. Um, they got to meet other people other than just their parents, both people with disabilities and the staff that works in the workshops. They got a degree of independence as they earned some money, okay? And if we say that everybody's got to meet, you know, got to get to minimum wage, there are some people who get to minimum wage. And there are a lot of people, and you will see this if you tour three or four of these workshops, who are not going to get to minimum wage. And they are going to wind up back either in day services, as a parent of one of the sons I was talking about referred to as babysitting, as day services, or back at home with their parents watching television. And that would be a tragedy if out of what our Congress does or what you guys do or whatever, it will be a tragedy if we go back that way and we do pick a few people and, you know, and set up something for them in the community, but you're going to wind up, I am afraid, of a lot of people going back, getting rid of the social benefits, which are huge of being in a workshop, and going back to, you know, mom and dad, uh, kind of the way folks like this what their lot in life was 100 years ago. And you got to look out, because that is something that could happen. You know, they didn't set up this sub-minimum wage to take advantage of people. They set up this sub-minimum wage because at that time, and I believe to this day, there is no way some of these people are going to be making a minimum wage, and we would rather have them in the community, both for the social benefits and their own economic benefits, than sitting at home or sitting in some uh, uh, facility. And that's what you got to look out for. Um, you know, Congressman, I really appreciate you telling the truth about your views. Um, and I think that we can talk here 
in some common ground. When I've gone around the country, I've met with a lot of community rehabilitation providers and direct support professional staff. And these are, I agree with you, people who have been at the front line of providing service often for decades with very little resources and inadequate pay. And these are people who have huge responsibility to families in their communities and to the community at large. And what they say quite often, and I'm not sure how this message is landing back here where decisions are made, but what they confide in you is that they're caught in a trap between new and old laws, having to grapple the inconsistencies between the requirements that are demanded of them to measure time with an egg timer to pay wages in this archaic and fossilized system of services, and to still give regard to the ADA and Olmstead, to still give regard to the mandate of the Medicaid Act, to still pay homage to WIOA in Section 511. And so I think the stress that direct support professionals are feeling is they lack the professional development, the training, the capacity building, how to bridge the gap. How do I get from this system to this system? How am I responsible for this? Where is the leadership to support me to support people to leave? And when you're moored to the infrastructure of a building and many vans and lots of physical infrastructure of what it takes to run a workshop, it requires extra funding, extra support to try to invest in the business development of these shops in order to switch their business model to support those direct support service professionals and your members in access and elsewhere around the country to transform. N nobody's losing a job. They're changing the mission of what the outcome of those services is. And let me tell you, the default setting forever has been an over and unjustified reliance on only segregation. The lion's share of federal service dollars still is poured into segregation to this day. The transformations bill is saying that we will provide more options for people who want to leave, who can and want to work. And we need to support direct support professionals and service providers in order to come along for the ride and be part of the solution. I, I, I'm glad you're talking about options because that's what we're for here. Options. Okay, we don't want to shut down these centers for the people who are happy in the centers. And a lot of them are not going to be happy if they leave the centers. And when people say we're shutting down the centers, you, you're removing options. The centers right now do work to put people in the community. Sometimes they fail, sometimes they succeed. And if you take some time touring these centers, you'll find out why some of them fail. But the, the fact remains, I know a lot of families with, kid, with, with kids in this situation. And if you shut down these centers, you're taking away an option from them. I'll give you one little anecdote. Uh, uh, I, I have a friend who works in one of these centers. And uh, she had somebody there who worked like five hours in, uh, out, outside or six hours outside uh, the center and the rest of the time in the center. She asked, asked the gal, which one do you like better? She said, oh, I like my job outside the center. But I like the job in the center because these are my friends. Okay, now that's just one example, but she liked working with the same people she had worked with for the last 20 years. She didn't want to be, you know, out in an, in an unfamiliar setting with people maybe you didn't have as much sympathy for. You're the one who wants to take away that option from her. I'm the one who's defending options, saying that the centers are for some people and the community is for some people. You're the folks who want to say, we want to get rid of the centers where tens of thousands of people in this country are happy today. I and appreciate they, the clarity of this yeah. position. I do know that a couple of other commissioners have questions and Mr. Lewis wanted to get in, to, and Ms. McSweeney. So let's, Mr. Lewis, then Ms. McSweeney, and then we'll move on to other questions. So uh, I, I just wanted to offer the, the question around choice that has not been spoken to is, is we've had from the previous panels demonstrations of how entities who have formerly been segregated uh, some of these work environments have been able to convert. Again, it's not easy, um, but that's a choice. So these entities that still want to maintain that use of the sub and wage provision, it's not a necessity as they continue to try to put it out there. It's a choice because it, it's been proven that it can be possible. It's just interesting. We're living in like parallel worlds. Uh, the founder of the National Federation of the Blind was a constitutional law scholar. Back in 1940, he started the NFB. He actually helped write information that helped with the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision. 
But at that same time, they were saying blind people couldn't work. And they had sheltered workshops. When 14C was implemented, there was a 50%, you couldn't pay anything less than 50% of the minimum wage. And they improved it by saying that you can pay no less than 25% of the minimum wage. Then they came back and improved it again and said, well, it's zero, the floor is zero. So all the protections that even in the initial attempt at implementing the legislation have, have just fallen short. And the last piece I'll offer related to this is, I do encourage you to go on a tour as well. Uh, being a person who used to give those tours, but I also encourage you to take someone who's knowledgeable about the discovery process, customized employment, a uh, person with a proven history of being able to take and assist people with disabilities, most significant disabilities, escape those environments and obtain a quality of life that is competitive and integrated. Thank you, Ms. McSweeney. I just wanted to add that um, Many of our members have used 14C certificates. Many of them do not in terms of access. So I don't want there to be the impression that all of our members uh, use a certificate. Um, all of our members work hard to uh, help people find employment uh, and just expand their lives in all kinds of ways, including finding employment. Uh, and that's through job coaches, uh, supported employment, uh, anything that they need. Often, often they need direct service um, supports during the day. I, I didn't read my statement a lot because I wanted to focus on some, uh, some very specific things, but right now the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is 6.9% as compared to 3.2% for people without disabilities. One of the things I said was we should be working together to help educate the business community. Now I had the good fortune of working for Microsoft at one point in my career. And so I wanted to say to Mr. Collins, you're exactly what we were, I was referring to when I, when I said we need to be working with the business community to really help the business community create opportunities and find opportunities for people with the most significant disabilities and to bring them in. And what you were saying about actually creating an interview process that provides an accommodation is really important because that's what we want. We want expanded opportunities. We all want that. Let's work together to achieve that and, and focus on closing that employment gap, not taking away jobs from people. Thank you. Commissioner Kirsten. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. Um, Mr. Collins used the term barriers to entry. And every time there is an increase in the minimum wage, there are a significant number of people who are dislocated as a result. Um, the most significant uh, group of people are black teens first, other blacks. Um, but when there was an increase in the minimum wage, I think of about 10% about 20 years ago, someone ran the numbers and showed that the unemployment rate among black teens went up 17%. So when you raise the minimum wage, there's a barrier to entry there. And I wonder if anyone's done any kind of analysis, crunched the numbers as to if 14C were eliminated, and we go up to a minimum wage of whatever it may be in the next few years, what will be the barriers to entry? Will there be a dislocation of 5, 10, 15, 30 percent of the individuals currently employed? Because what, that, what we're addressing right now is the potential elimination of 14C, and will that present a barrier to entry? That's precisely the study that, <clears throat> excuse me, does need to be done. And uh, one of the things I commented on, these are the questions, this is the very question that we need to be asking, is what happens when 14C goes away? And there are, uh, there was the main study that was done, but there's very little substantive that, substantive that looks really specifically from an unbiased source what happens in those states where 14C has been eliminated, because we can actually really drill down on that and see what people's lives have been like. Yeah, because this is not a zero-sum game here. We've got data from... In 1954, before significant increases in the minimum wage, black teens had higher employment rates than white teens. This is before the 19 Civil Rights Act. This was in Jim Crow South. Then there were significant increases in the minimum wage. Black teens now have horrendous employment rates. Right now, the best of all time in the last 40 years, but compared to 1954, labor participation rates are very low. So when we're talking about something that causes a rise in the minimum wage, we're talking about economics here. People have options. And so I'm wondering whether or not people will be displaced in terms of employment, and we haven't even done any studies along these lines? 
I, I will point out that there is a bill right now in Congress to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which passed the House. It's not going to pass the Senate for political reasons. Not political reasons, just a different, different viewpoint among the political parties. But in that bill, there is the statutory language to get rid of 14C. And it's not an oversight because we tried to amend that statutory language out. So you're right. Where, well, for some of the other reasons you say, I don't like the idea of raising the minimum wage from 750 to 15. Common sense will tell you, study or not, that if you go up from 750 an hour to 15 an hour, at the same time you get rid of 14C, it's going to be devastating to the. Uh, to the disability community and, and people know exactly what they're doing because we tried to amend it out the, the, when in that minimum wage bill today which depends what happens politically in the next election if, if the people who push that bill get what they want it's 15 bucks an hour for disabled people and I think it's just going to be devastating for them. a wage Relate. minimum or otherwise presumes a job and you make arbitrary increases in the minimum wage very nice and you feel good about it but what about the people who no longer have a job I, I would, and we haven't, what I'm getting here is a consensus. Nobody knows what will happen if you get rid of 14C. It looks like Mr. Lewis wanted to answer to your, I'll, answer I'll just, your question. I'll, n no, one, no one knows the impact overall, but I'd offer two things related to this question. One is the quote of, of the unemployment rate of people with disabilities. That, that's been one of those kind of red herring statistics. But what's important to understand is that even with the existence of the shelter workshops, that, that statistic has not changed until recently uh, with respect to the employment of people with disabilities because we're now going to a model where, and this is my evolution as well, I used to help people get employed by saying it's the socially responsible thing to do. This is the way I would introduce them into the, to the corporation. But luckily, I evolved and realized that business, the bottom line is you have to make sure that that person is going to be an asset to the company. So then I started introducing actual employees into a work environment that showed that they demonstrated a skill to meet the bottom line. So in the past, when I introduced them with the social morally model, when business went bad, yeah, they were out of the door. But when I introduced them with being competitive and being a benefit, they were usually the last, if at all, to be let go if necessary. In many instances, we found that bringing those individuals on board helped the whole place become more productive. Um, so related to the uh, statistic, I think that what would be really important if we were to evaluate that is we have to not just say this person is employed and if, the, if it increases, this is what happens because it may just be a result of this person may be in this place for all of the wrong reasons. But when a person with a disability provide the proper training, support, and opportunity to obtain a real job, they're going to be subject to the same types of ebbs and flows around the economic situation as any other employee, and that's what we're trying to get to. As long as people with disabilities are seen as something different, that need something more, uh, that, that are a burden rather than an asset, then we're always going to continue to have this, this discussion, and we won't move, continue to move the needle into a more positive space. Ms. Klein, and then uh, Commissioner Narasaki has a question, but we're past time. So yeah, I, to I want to play volleyball with my, I'm going to pass, I'm going to volley to Brian here in a second, because, you know, if you talk to your friends at Microsoft, they'll tell you there's a war for talent in this country. They're looking for people with disabilities to hire. I've talked to manufacturers, they're looking for people with disabilities to hire. We're at, at or near full employment. You know, until recently, people were saying this is, this economy is doing, is, is kicking. It's kicking along. And yet, we're, the absence of people with disabilities in the, in the open market is conspicuous. And so what are we doing wrong? We're having conversations about whether including them in the federal minimum wage that has been extended to everybody else in the country since 1938 will diminish jobs. Well, let's look at the report card. We're spending multiple billions of dollars every year on services in which three to five percent of people ever leave for the open market. We're doing that with the intentionality for them to leave for the open market. And we're not measuring the results in any other regard. And the employers are knocking on the door saying, give me ready, job willing candidates. And yet we've spent all of our time and our resources training people in jobs of the last century. And so now there's a skills gap as jobs are continuing to change. We're like repairing an airplane mid-flight. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Commissioner Arasaki. Well, it's very, it's very clear to me that uh, you guys aren't going to be able to convince each other to change your mind, so I'm going to change the subject. Um, so 
we heard a lot of testimony. We've done a lot of reading that says that while there are certainly uh, good employers, good sheltered efforts, the reality is that there are a lot of places that are violating the laws uh, with impunity and treating, unfortunately, their clients uh, uh, in a way that violates even the, the basic laws that we have. So I'd like to ask you, uh, Ms. McSweeney, how would you fix that? Well, or do you acknowledge all, that there are abuses? I, I, I will tell you that when there are abuses, and there are not access members who have been accused of abuses, uh, when there are abuses, we applaud uh, the Department of Labor's efforts to uh, uh, penalize or take away a certificate, because we don't tolerate that. Yes. But and do you have suggestions have about how to, to that effect. do you have suggestions about how to improve it? Because we've heard I, that there have been almost no uh, decertification. So that clearly well, is not a very it, huge hammer there. So to be honest with you, what could we be doing to? It's a little bit like asking when did you stop beating your wife? Because I'm not. I don't actually accept the premise of the question based because I haven't read what you've read. I only know you, from my you, own. Experience. You don't accept the premise that there are some. Not your, not your members, but that they're clearly because there's I, been enforcement and litigation to the uh, that I, there are some abuses. I know that uh, the Department of Labor has uh, has done its job and closed uh, do, closed down a couple of places and, and eliminated some certificates. We think that's a good thing when that happens. Yes, um, which is great. Yeah. So what else could, what else should we be recommending if 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 Fortune C stays in place then. We have to worry about abuses, and so what else could we put in place? Well, I don't think you have to worry about abuses uh, with respect to uh, 14C any more than you would have to worry about abuses in any work environment for anyone. I mean, it's it's all we the worry same. a lot about abuses yeah, so, for exactly, yeah. But but, but, but that's why I'm but saying in this situation related. we're focused on this I, kind of employment. I, I what do you think that the what in my in in. Commissioner Debele's language, what would be additional guardrails to make sure that the people that we all care about are not being abused? Our, I can speak for our members in saying that they are supportive of wage and hours enforcement and appreciate the efforts that wage and hours made. So um, the fact that wage and hours said that they were enhancing their enforcement and doing more of that, I think, speaks for itself. And I think Mr. Collins has a recommendation, and then I want to close this out. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the areas that we've experienced as we've been out in our industry with our peer companies and uh, similar real estate and facilities companies is that there's a lack of awareness of this talent. Uh, one of the first things people ask us is, what is supported employment? And we spend time talking about that, and we talk about the talented folks who are available to work. Um, Regina talked about the lack of uh, the, the low unemployment rate at the moment. Again, we go back to this idea of an untapped talent because people, employers in particular, are not aware. They start off usually in companies because there's a relative of a family member who uh, has a disability and takes off from there. Um, if you're lucky enough in the enterprise, it might be a family member of influence in that company. Uh, so one of the ideas is if, if we can make a stronger awareness of the talent that's available to go do great work in our communities, I think we'll be more successful. Thank you very much. I thank this panel for your expertise and for your testimony today, and uh, we will conclude here. We will, will reconvene at 5.30 p.m. for public comment, and any participants in the open public comment period should report back at 5.15 so that we're ready for you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I just I wanted to get that one. That was excellent. I don't know. Was that for the blister? No, your no, 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 no. It's no. You're saving me. It's okay. It was nice meeting you. I was paying you a compliment. I, 